Hi, I'm Lucas. And I'm Brian. And this is the Quacks Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, and welcome to a special 50th extended episode. Now, today, I have a guest that many of you will recognize. His name is Georgi Dinkov, and he is a prominent poster on social media and different forums under the name Hydut or Hydut. I don't know quite how to say that. Uh, he has a supplement store called Idea Labs, where he sells some of the most uh, unique and powerful combinations that really exist in the industry. I, I mean, I should know. I've tried most supplements, and his are by far some of the most powerful out there. And what I really love about Georgie is his energy, uh, his enthusiasm for this industry, and just his willingness to put in the work and make his ideas uh, become a reality. So back in 2014 and 2015, I uh, started reading this researcher named Ray Pete, who we've talked about on earlier podcasts. And Ray has some really crazy ideas at first sight. But as you get deeper into his writings, they kind of start to make a lot of sense. And Georgie is very motivated by Ray Pete's writing. So I'm going to do my best to encapsulate what I understand from Ray. And I think it will give you some good context on the upcoming episode. Now, there are many theories out there uh, around how the body works. You might be surprised to know that uh, certain aspects of how our cells work is actually still up for debate. Now, a very popular analogy used uh, for our bodies is the car analogy. Uh, you know, the car, it has uh, separate parts like we do. If one of those parts breaks, you know, the car won't really run properly and, and so on and so forth. But this analogy, it's not quite right because you can turn a car off. I actually really like the analogy of a magnet and nails. So if you take some nails uh, and you line them up and place a magnet on one end, the nails will adhere to each other in a straight line. Uh, the magnet is like metabolic energy in this analogy, and the nails are uh, protein structures of our organs and tissues. Now, if you take the magnet away from the nails, uh, the ordered structure that the nails were in dissolves and the nails fall away from each other, kind of into a chaotic clump. Now, our bodies, unlike cars, they can't turn off. Uh, you could say we are machines that are maintained by energy going through them. So like the magnet, you know, if you take away the energy going through the body machine, it will fall apart into, you know, its separate parts and into chaos, just kind of like you die and everything kind of breaks down. And so it's kind of just like those nails without the magnet. It's the same, same thing. So what Ray focuses on is the metabolic energy that is flowing through the body machine. Uh, there's, you know, past cultures have a lot of different concepts of this uh, called chi or prana. Uh, and the stronger and more persistent that energy is, really the stronger our bodies. So for example, think about things, uh, let's say you find attractive in the face. So uh, symmetry of facial features is one, tight skin, uh, maybe eyes that are, you know, tilted a little up instead of down. Uh, if you remember back actually to the mewing episode about proper facial structure and tongue posture, uh, attractive faces kind of require strong muscles pulling in certain directions to prevent the face from elongating. And, and humans generally find that an elongated face is less attractive than uh, like a scrunched up face. That's not the right word. But anyway, so all of these require metabolic energy. And as your energy falls, the ability of the body to keep these aspects strong deteriorates. Now, I, you know, I just use the facial attraction as an example. We could also use different organ systems, digestion, muscle tone, uh, and, and it would work just as well as an example. So getting back to Ray, this viewpoint is to health what like relativity is to physics. It combines many different body systems and processes under one umbrella called the metabolism. And, and so it really lets you analyze things from, from a metabolic viewpoint. And if you can restore good metabolism to a tissue, it will strengthen the structure of that tissue. So this means, you know, any loss of function, whether that be bad digestion or, you know, a weak heart or brain fog, it could be improved by addressing the metabolism. Now, when I first started reading Georgie, he was posting research all the time. Uh, the implications of the research were tied in with Ray's writing. And at the time, I found it really life-changing in how 
I understood my body and how to live a good life. You know, it just put a lot of things together in my mind that were kind of little puzzle pieces here and there. And it kind of lumped it all under this metabolic energy or this chi energy. And it just really helped me understand. Now, not only that, Georgie started selling supplements and putting into practice some of Ray's recommendations. See, before Georgie, you know, Ray would mention a substance or a vitamin that was no longer manufactured. So nobody could really try them. But Georgie went out there and he had these substances made in a lab so we could actually try it and see if what Ray was saying uh, was actually true. A great example of that is uh, Ray always used to talk about vitamin E from wheat germ uh, was much superior to the vitamin E made from soy. Uh, And nobody was able to really find a wheat germ vitamin E. And and Georgie actually went out and had one made. And now you can go buy vitamin E from wheat germ and try it out and see if it compares to the vitamin E derived from soy. Anyway, so that's what Georgie does. He puts into practice the theories of Ray Pete and he lets us see if they are right and wrong. He is like a trailblazing entrepreneur that always has something new on his plate, always has something brewing, you know, in the pot that may upend everything we know. And in that theme, he has decided to fund his own studies on cancer. Now, in this podcast, you will be able to hear about these studies. And, you know, if the studies go the way he thinks they will, their implications are really going to change how we view cancer. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to outline a few things. First, uh, this episode has a lot of discussion on theory and the principles around health. Uh, Towards the end, we kind of get into the more practical applications. Secondly, we mentioned this briefly in the episode itself, but to reiterate, DHT is a hormone derived from testosterone, the male hormone. Uh, The current model around prostate cancer says DHT can cause or uh, exasperate prostate cancer. Knowing this going in, it's going to be helpful when Georgie talks about his DHT study. Thirdly, towards the end of the episode, Georgie mentions methylene blue. I don't think we've ever talked about methylene blue on the podcast. So for those who don't know, it is a blue dye that was originally created in Germany at the end of the 1800s. It has really some interesting uses. It was used as an anti-malarial drug during the Second World War. Uh, The soldiers actually didn't like it much. They had this saying uh, because it turned their pee blue. So they, they had this saying that went, even at the loo, we see, we pee, navy blue. Anyway, methylene blue, uh, it's also been shown to work as an antidepressant. It might help uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. And I've included a link on methylene blue if you want to read more about it. Uh, And if you want to try it, Georgie has it under the name Oxidol at his online store. So there it is. That's it from me. Enjoy this special extra long 50th episode with Georgie Dinkov. Hey, everybody. Uh, I have Georgie here with me today, also known as Heidet from uh, the RPF Forum. Georgie, dude, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it for inviting me. I, um, I, I feel very honored to being able to share um, the, you know, the research, some of it mine, some of it from other people with, uh, with the rest of the, of the general public, and hopefully it's beneficial for them as it was for me. Yeah, I'm. That's really great. I mean, we're going to get into your research and stuff, but before we jump into that, I think most people probably know your background. Uh, but for people who don't, could you kind of just briefly give us, uh, you know, how you got into health and wellness and and supplements and all that? Uh, yeah. So my academic background is actually computer science. Um, I have a degree in computer, two degrees. I mean, two bachelors and one masters. Uh, the bachelor's ones are, are in uh, mathematics and computer science. Uh, I went to school here at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Um, I came directly from Bulgaria in 1997. So basically, I went directly to Georgetown, um, basically spent five years there studying these two majors. Um, and uh, I was I was a competitive roarer when I was in college. So I was, I was always being uh, sort of like involved in athletics, in, in athletics one way or the other. Um, and then while I was at Georgetown, I started working as an intern, and then lately, uh, after that, it became a, a more of a full-time job at an outfit called the National Biomedical Research Foundation. And they do basically, clearly, they're, they're, you know, so it's it's outfit dealing with biochemistry, biology, physiology, etc., and medicine. 
And what they did was they were they were building this database of proteins, uh, basically all kinds of proteins that people either discover themselves in nature or synthesize, and they just provide an interface where you can submit that protein or search for other proteins that are similar to it. So I was the guy, that, one of the computer guys that was you know involved in building that system, um, and then it was just two IT people and about forty other um, you know experts, subject matter experts. And all of them were either PhDs in biochemistry or MDs or, you know, other, um, in general, other highly qualified staff working in, in biology and medicine, biochemistry. So, I mean, naturally, if, if, if most of the people are coming from a medical background, that's what they, they will be discussing, you know, when they're at work and after work and happy hours, right? So, I, you know, we started going out and, you know, I, you kind of feel left out if all you know is computers and all these people talk about is is proteins and enzymes and diseases and 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 you know and how to how to tackle this disease or that disease you know just you either learn to blend in or you will be left out there's really no other way about it so i just you know i i, I got interested and i kept asking like so what can i do to learn more and they kept saying that was back in like circa 2002 2003 between 2000 and 2005 i was involved with this outfit um you know one year as an intern and then like uh, two other years as a full-time employee so I kept asking what can I do to learn, and at that point, the internet had already matured enough, and there was a lot of stuff that was already published online, so they kept saying, you don't really need to go, to, if all you want is the knowledge, you don't really need to go to school like we did, you know, like, the school is just to get you credentialed and to allow you to do official work, quote-unquote, right? So I so said, what's official work? Well, if you want to apply for grants, if you want to get money, if you want other people to pay you to do what you want to do, then then they're not going to give this money to somebody who is a schmo, you know, like, like me. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, what if I don't want to do that? If, it, if I just want to learn, I said, well, you, you don't need, you don't need to go to school. Like, I mean, you're already at Georgetown. So start attending the seminar. So, so they were involved. Basically many of them were professors at the university of Georgetown. Some of them were John Hopkins. Many of them came from NIH, National Institutes of Health. There's a, there's a, there's an entire institute there called the NCBI, National Center for Bioinformatics, uh, for biochemistry and informatics, I think. And basically it's, so half of the people were from there. So I, you know, I started attending these seminars they were giving. Um, and then they gave me a few books to read, you know, sort of like as a prep. So little by little, I, I got involved. And after, to use the expression, after you acquired the lingo, after that, it's all practice. And by practice, I mean, they were saying, look, here's PubMed. <laughs> Just go and read. That's all there is to it, right? Yeah. And then if you're lucky enough, at some point, they were saying you should start doing your own research, but they said you're not credentialed for that, right? So it'll be hard for you to do your own research because people will not be will not be willing to give you money, right? I mean, you may be able to help out somebody else who already has a grant or some kind of other contract with the industry, right? But it'll be hard for you to do work directly as, a, as, as an independent researcher. And they were right. They were right. Up until last year, basically, I was not able to do any research of my own, even though I tried. Every, every person that I approached regardless of the fact that I was able to, you know, hold my own and have a conversation with them on really like these state-of-the-art biochemical topics, at the end of the day, the question always was, okay, where did you go to school? What did you learn? What's your degree in? And who can vouch for you, right? And I guess I could come up with people that would vouch for me, but, you know, just my resume with this computer science degree on it just did not look very convincing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so after I, you know, after uh, I quit working for this uh, biochemical outfit, I just kept studying more and more and more and more. And eventually around 2014, um, when I started posting the Ray Pete forum, one of the users there approached me and said, hey, dude, like you keep posting all these studies. Um, I mean, aside from having a blog, which was recommended to me back in the day, like, you know, having my own blog, they're saying, have you thought about selling this stuff, like formulating and selling this stuff? I'm like, no. Well, you should, you know, it's kind of like there are a lot of people that are busy or they don't understand enough or, you know, in the, these are not drugs. You, you should be able to formulate some of these supplements and sell them yourself. So that's how that's how I started. You know, the first product was Estroban, which is uh, just a mix of four vitamins. Right. And that's that's what I started doing. So, you know, little by little over the course of what, five, six years now, um, it built up a little bit of momentum um, enough to allow me to fund my own studies. And that's that's I guess we're gonna jump into that later. But that's that's basically now I'm at the point where because my co former coworkers were 100% right and nobody was willing to give, is willing to give me money still to do my own research. I had to finance things myself. But it's probably for the best, you know. To be honest with you, 
the more I live, the more I learn, the more I understand. If you want to do something, if you want to be able to implement your ideas, the more independent you can be, the more, the more you, the more, the more successful you'll be in doing what you want. Doesn't mean the topic that you that you'll be applying will be turn out to be right, but at least nobody will be, you know, um, I don't know, harassing you. Nobody will be asking you for feedback. Nobody will asking you for updates. Oh, mm. where is the project plan? Where is it? Where are your deliverables? Right. So it's kind of you only have to report to yourself. And many people think it's like, oh wow, that's a recipe for disaster. You never get anything done. No, my experience is that having now my own company and you know. Um, and you know, being 42 years old, my experience is that like basically, when you work for yourself, you deliver or you drown. And the same thing applies for the for the for these studies that I'm trying to do myself. So it's if I'm going to disappoint somebody, it will be me, which is <laughs> you know the worst person to disappoint. So I really don't. Uh, I, it, what I'm trying to say is that it worked better than working for a large company where you probably have to spend an exorbitant amount of of time and effort and resources to justify even the simple study with, with, with mice, you know, that basically with hamsters that, 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 that we just did last year. Yeah. Um, so far it's been working well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say that because I've worked um, mostly in small businesses for my life. And I always notice, you know, the closer you are to uh, you could say where the action happens or where there are consequences for your action, um, I mean, you've talked a little bit about dopamine and stuff like that. It really makes everything you're doing so much more meaningful. And so, you know, when you're saying like independence and, and you know, relying on yourself, it really is. Once you start getting a taste of that for a couple of years, it's so hard to go back and get into like some, you know, giant bureaucratic machine. Uh, it's, it's just, oh, it's such a difference, you know? Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the, with the writer? His name is Nicholas Taleb. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The black swan. See, so I'll send you an essay. He wrote an essay, How to Legally Own Another Person. Um, And it's nothing really groundbreaking, but basically the idea, and he touches, he actually expands on this topic in that essay. He's basically saying, in large corporations, you'll see, especially in finance or or sales, that around 90% of the benefit is really concentrated coming from, there's like a very small clique of people. But these people are so uncontrollable. They're so independent-minded. They're so disruptive. To the organization, I mean, that the organization feels threatened and does everything possible to isolate and sort of like cordon these people off, so they so they don't infect the rest of the staff because <laughs> they might start they might start giving them ideas, you know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you don't need a slave. Maybe you can work for yourself. Maybe you can do things better if you didn't have an incompetent boss to stop on top of you and keep telling you what to do, right? Yeah, that, that kind of. Well, actually, so, yeah, totally agree. actually, yeah. this podcast is in part inspired by Taleb because he wrote, I think in his uh, third book, it wasn't Skin in the Game, it was the one before that. Uh, and he wrote about the difference between empirics and, uh, you know, logical doctors. And basically how right. these empirics were the one who were experimenting and doing trial and error. And the doctors were the one who kind of had this top-down approach of, of using logic and saying, okay, if we assume this, then this must be the treatment. And how they kind of, you know, over time just had to take from the empirics who were actually out there doing, uh, finding what really works. And so this podcast is called Quacks you know, Q-U-A-X, because it's like the quack doctors were the ones who, yeah, like nine times out of 10, they were, you know, giving people mercury and and crazy things. But one time out of 10, they were the ones who really discovered something that changed how health was viewed. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, if you you think about how how life works on a daily basis, it all comes down, it starts with tinkering, right? Yeah. Uh, You sit there, something seems, something looks interesting, feels interesting. And if you have the time and the resources, you pursue it. And then over time, as you're building a little bit, you know, these bits of information, the natural state of mind is the induction, which is Aristotle wrote about as well. So you start coming up with a theory that would explain what you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And then the way it should work is like you start with tinkering, which is the specifics. Then you go to generalization, which is a theory. And then you try to apply the theory again and see how well it tests. If you test it, try to improve it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a full cycle. But unfortunately, in medicine, what we have right now is uh, everything is guided by dogma. So in other words, many of the practitioners that are in the field, actually almost all of them, except some very highly positioned people of power, almost uh, used to be the doctors actually in the field were able to and allowed to and even required to improve care by things they discovered in the field. Now, if you're, if the, these days, if you're a primary care practitioner, and let's say you have strong beliefs that 
you know, a specific drug that you prescribe is not working as, as, as whatever the brochure is saying it should do, right? You can't really do much. I mean, basically, the, your local state board, uh, your boss, if you have one, your partner, whatever, the, everything is stacked against you. And basically, they're saying, don't you dare start start getting ideas and start becoming independent-minded. We can get sh- shoot the hell out of us if you try to do something that's not according to the FDA guidelines, right? Yes. So it's like your work is controlled on your uh, – not on your – I mean, basically, it's some, your work is already cut out for you. And there's very little wiggle room you have, even even none at this point. I mean, it's not a coincidence that doctors have the highest suicide rate of any profession. It used to be one of the lowest. So to go from like a, you know what the bottom twenty five percent of suicide rates, you know you know per 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 worker in that field to the very top in less than a century speaks that something dramatically must have changed in that field. And I think it comes down to people feeling restricted and basically being told what to do with other people's lives. While you you know you when you when you were this uh, wide-eyed, independent-minded, bushy-haired youngster who went to mm-hmm. medical school, you probably thought that one day you'll be able to help people. Yet now you're being told what to do, and even if you feel like it's not helping people, there's there's very little you can do. I mean, learn helplessness is a huge thing in a medical profession. I think that that's what's driving the suicide rate. You feel like you're killing people, and there's there's nothing mm-hmm. that you feel you can do. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like they have a recipe book, really. And it the crazy thing is, is, is it makes them manipulatable. You can literally go in and depending on the words you use, it's like they have to go down that recipe book. And so like one thing I tell people with chronic disease is, you know, if you're going to a doctor and, uh, you know, you're talking about your symptoms, like no matter what, like tell them you're happy and you have friends and, you know, life is good for you because you don't want to get on to the recipe book for depression and mental exactly. illness. You know, yeah, you don't want exactly. to go down that track. So no matter what you do, just say you, you're in a great mood all the time, you're really happy, but you're dealing with these issues. Um, and so, I don't know, it, it almost makes them, it, they're powerful in a way, but they're also very easy to manipulate. Well, the power actually, it's not coming from them, right? They're being told what to do, and they're, they're just following rules, and actually they're following orders. Because if they don't do what's what are the official guidelines for, for specific disease, they can get sued. And and even though it doesn't happen very often, it's actually very hard to prove malpractice. And fortunately, true malpractice, at least legally, is is, rare, is a rare thing, right? You, you don't hear every day on the news that somebody you know, voluntarily you know operates on people and cut out their liver when they should have been taking out their kidney. It's, it just doesn't happen. Thankfully, it doesn't happen very often. But the, like all of the all of the society, there are these number of different medical societies in the United States, like this, you know, the American Co- College of Cardiology, American Society of Hematology, American Society of Gynecology. So all of these societies, which are powerful political groups, and they're supposed to be composed, really, they're being representative of the, the actual practitioners in the field. They come up with these rules or they're called guidelines, really. But, you know, the guidelines are, yeah, yeah, you, you're free to adopt them or not. But guess what? If you don't adopt them and you end up getting sued, we're not going to come to help you, right? You're on your own in court. Like, we're going to say that you did something that we as a profession do not think was the standard of the standard of care is what they call it. So guess what? Most doctors are not going to risk it, right? You have to be a pretty – have to come from a pretty specific background and must have had a partic- very, very peculiar lifestyle – to be able to turn around and tell to this powerful agency that can control your future, the entire professional future, and say, you know what? I don't care what you people are saying. To me, this is wrong. I'm going to do it my way. Just, just think, just think of how that sounds. It doesn't, just doesn't sound uh, like, doesn't sound like, like, like the way a regular doctor talks. If you've ever, if you've ever spoken to doctors for more than ten minutes, they seem to be pretty militaristic about it. They follow orders, or people die. That's what I, that's what I keep getting told, hmm. told by other doctors. Like, listen, son. We follow orders or people die. What was that quote from the movie A Few Good Men? Wasn't that like the the, the same quote that Jack Nicholson gave? Oh, something like, like the, that. You can't handle Tom the Cruise truth. Tom Cruise was saying like, <laughs> right, but Tom Cruise was saying like, is there like a chance that uh, you gave the order for the soldier not to be harmed and, not, and these people you told ignore your order? And Jack Nicholson was like, what? Yeah. Ignore my order? Like, no, son. In our field, we follow orders or people die. And I, I, I've gotten that same attitude, that same response in different words from every single doctor 
um, over 40 that I've ever dis- discussed this issue with. They follow orders or people die. That's pretty much their motto. Yeah. Wow. I could probably talk to you about this for hours. So let's uh, let's try and get to your studies here before we uh, get off totally into the weeds. So <laughs> you, you have a super unique experience, I think, compared to most people out there in that you actually finished uh, a clinical trial recently on one of your yeah. research chemicals. It's called Cordonon. Uh, it's a combination of two over-the-counter hormones, progesterone and DHEA. And, you know, if people are interested, they can get it at uh, Georgie's store uh, in the research chemicals. So what can you tell us about Cordonon? So Cordonon basically is just like you said, it's a combination of progesterone and DHEA. And the reason that it's a liquid product, right, it's dissolved in vitamin E, and there's a little bit of fat added to it to, to improve absorption. Um, and the reason I chose these two steroids is, I mean, progesterone has already been extensively written um, uh, about by, by, by Ray Pete, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there, was, there wasn't much specific guidance in terms of how much needs to be taken and for what specific purpose. And I kept re- reading these studies, especially older ones, which showed that there's kind of a little bit of a sweet spot uh, when it comes to progesterone and immune system, like too little and you're not going to get the benefit too much. And then cor- uh, progesterone starts to mimic some of the effects of cortisol. So so progesterone is a very powerful cortisol receptor antagonist when used in a specific dosage. DHEA happens to be also one of the main endogenous antagonists to cortisol. And cortisol is really one of the main reasons we're getting old and sick um, you can actually produce every single symptom of aging by administering an excessive dosage of cortisol or at least high enough for a specific period of time, right? So and conversely, uh, there are multiple studies that have, been shown that have demonstrated that if you block the effects of cortisol, you're getting a number of beneficial, desirable um, like results. Um, and you can, if you talk to the bodybuilding field, the people in the, that are bodybuilders, they'll immediately tell you, of course, like, or, or, you know, uh, we, we keep injecting steroids to, to keep our muscles, you know, to, to make our muscles grow. But what makes the muscles grow? And this is a question that if, if you go to the best experts that are in the world right now, nobody can tell you definitively. But if you look through about, through about 100 different studies, you'll find out that about 80% of the anabolic effect of these steroids is due to blockade of the effects of cortisol. And cortisol is highly catabolic for muscles. Uh, every, almost every bodybuilder and even like a lay person on the street probably knows that at this point. It's also very anti-catabolic for bones. Uh, I'm sorry, very, very catabolic for bones. It's very catabolic for the brain, for your skin. There's probably isn't an organ in your body that, that would not suffer if it gets exposed to like a sufficient amount of cortisol for a sufficient amount of time. So there is, there's be, to this day, there's a, there's a very high need, commercial need and medical need of, of making, of having a chemical out there that blocks the effects of cortisol, at least the excessive, like the pathological effects of cortisol. Mm. There is a molecule, commercial, uh, commercial that's, that's capable of doing that, but unfortunately it has toxicities and it's, it really, it's actually used for something else. So the, the so-called abortion pill, RU486, was actually developed, it designed as a glucocorticoid antagonist by a company, Sanofi, in, um, in France in the 1950s. But at the time, the, they, they developed this chemical out of pure research interest, but there was no market for it, right? Hmm. However, very astutely, actually, and actually there, there are three or four more chemicals in the same group. Ulipristal is another one, that's the, that's the chemical name for it. Uh, so they all basically modified molecules that, that look similar to, to the... Um, uh, anabolic steroid called nandrolone, hmm. which is what bodybuilders inject with. So these researchers looked at the nandrolone molecule and said, how can we uh, you know, take this and basically make it even, even stronger cortisol antagonist? So they added an extra molecule at position C11, which is the you know position 11 on the on the actual steroid core, right? Okay. And then they said, okay, th- this is really powerful glucocorticoid antagonist. And then they also found out that it also happens to block progesterone's effects as well. Now, this is not a coincidence. The glucocorticoid receptor and progesterone receptor are really similar in terms of their amino acid composition. Both of them are enzymes and and are composed of amino acids. Anyways, long story short, towards the end of the 50s, the marketing department at the chemical company uh, sort of like was looking at the social changes and saying, oh, wow, feminism is picking up steam all over the world and birth control is becoming a thing, right? And we here basically have this chemical that can actually cause abortions on demand. So it's almost like the morning after pill, but this goes one step further. 
Now, when there's already, when there's already established pregnancy, um, it can terminate it. Actually, it can terminate any pregnancy. Whether it's, whether it's advanced or, or very early in the stage, it doesn't matter. But the way they started marketing this was, here's this pill, and you can use it to perform chemical abortions. And for better or worse, that's how this drug is now known. You know, the, the, the scientific alias is RU486, but it's known as the abortion pill. Yeah. And that's what, it's, that's what it currently is being used for mostly. But what people, most people don't know, and even the doctors that use the drug don't know, is that this drug is also being used to treat the so-called Cushing disease, which is the disease caused by excessive production of cortisol. And if you look at people with Cushing disease, no matter what they age, you'll immediately uh, you know, be, be shocked to see that you're, you're essentially looking at all the features of aging men, uh, expanded middle section, loss of muscle tissue, balding, um, like hunchbacked. Um, you know, poor skin quality, uh, maybe even acne, mm -hmm. even even at, at an adult age. So all of these things are actually caused by excess cortisol, and this drug successfully treats the disease. Guess what? Progesterone is the endogenous version of RU486 minus most of the side effects. So it makes you know perfect sense to use progesterone uh, to block some of the effects of cortisol and. Ray Pete has been writing in many of his articles. I don't think he has an article where he doesn't mention progesterone at least once. But he does have a few articles specifically about progesterone's effects on blocking, you know, the the, the excess, the, 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 the pathology that stems from excessive um, levels of cortisol, right? Yeah. And he spends some other articles less, less verbosely to talk about DHEA, which is the second endogenous, actually probably the two out of three, third one will be pregnenolone, but DHEA is another endogenous potent glucocorticoid antagonist. So I said, okay, so a few studies came out recently which showed that most of the chronic diseases in aging, especially cancer, are due to immune system decline. And other studies showed that, of course, immune system decline is mostly driven by the atrophy of the thymus gland. And then atrophy of the thymus gland is very well known that it's caused by cortisol and estrogen. So I said, oh, wow. So progesterone can block the effects of excessive cortisol. Progesterone is known as the endogenous estrogen antagonist. DHEA can also block many of the, um, you know, the effects of, cor of cortisol. And now there are studies specifically showing that progesterone or DHEA on their own are highly anabolic for the thymus gland. In fact, they can reverse the atrophy that has been seen with aging. So I said, okay, so let's come up with a product that basically blocks the effects of cortisol and see what we can do with that. So that's how that name came about. It's Corinone, right? It's the negating the effects of cortisol. So those that, that's what it's composed of. And the, the reason for a specific ratio is that I looked at some studies that showed at what point, like I mentioned before, progesterone seems to have a sweet spot for, for the anabolism on the thymus gland. And, you know, the ratio is such that provides you, if you use it in the daily doses that are, that are suggested, provides you with about that amount, which in animal studies was shown to have the most potent trophic effect on the thymus gland. So I said, let's take this product now and see what it can do for cancer. Why cancer? Because, well, first of all, cancer, I don't know how many people know, but cancer right now, it became the leading cause of death in, the, in developed countries. Used to be the number three cause. Hmm. Then it became the number two cause, and now it's number one. Now it's still worldwide. Cardiovascular disease is still number one, but the research, like the, if you look at the trends and the way the cancer rates are rising, uh, within within seven years, if nothing changes, within seven years, cancer will become the number one cause of death worldwide um, in terms of diseases. Uh, cardiovascular disease will shift to number two spot. And another thing that many people don't probably don't know is that iatrogenic causes are number three. In other words, if cancer and, and heart attacks don't kill, your doctor will. Yeah, yeah. Number three is like medical errors and uh, over-treatment exactly. and, and that kind of thing. Exactly. So just as, Side effects, all kinds of, yeah. Yeah, so just to sum it up, basically, cortinone is there to lower cortisol. And cortisol is this stress hormone that, you know, causes basically aging. Uh, all the signs, right. you know, Cushing's disease is a disease of high cortisol, and it has all the signs of, of aging, and, and cancer is one of those things. And so cortinone is really these two hormones to address cortisol in particular and, and lower that in people. Is that kind of a good summary? 
Yeah, good, good summer. And basically, the, just to keep things in mind, it doesn't necessarily lower cortisol, but it blocks some of its. So it's not going to push you into something called Addison disease, which is cortisol deficiency. Ah. It, it will leave your cortisol where it is. So it, it will it will not mess with that, but it will protect from from cortisol causing too much atrophy. In other words, because you do need cortisol, right? It, it is a vital hormone, maintains your blood sugar, it keeps inflammation low. But what happens with age is that if you talk to endocrinologist, even in their standard model, is at around the age of 20, right? Your your production of DHEA and cortisol, uh, DHEA and progesterone peaks, and it matches the production of cortisol. So the, about, at around the age of 20, you're really in peak health, and, and, and many endocrinologists think that it's the hormonal balance that explains a good deal of that. N- namely, your, your cortisol production is, is is robust, but you also have a robust production of things that control cortisol. But guess what happens with aging, especially after the age of 35, the levels of DHEA and progesterone plummet. And in menopausal women, progesterone levels are down to undetectable, right? That's the progesterone now, they, at least officially, it's a condition of, of progesterone, and they call it also an estrogen deficiency. You don't have any. Hmm. So in other words, and while the, the cortisol levels, they stay about the same for, for your entire life. So you can think of aging as simply the decline in the production of factors that oppose cortisol, or at least oppose its effects. And that's what cortisol is supposed to do, kind of bring you up to that balance which you had at the age of 20 when you had, you know, some stuff you could do endogenously to oppose the effects of cortisol, to oppose the effects of stress. Okay, so that's an interesting distinction that it's not actually lowering cortisol. It's basically matching the right. cortisol that's there. And so you took this right, exactly. this substance and then you did a study with it. So what what is that structure of that study? Uh, I'll send you the report after we're done. I mean, I already have the the final report. It's uh, they're still trying to publish it in journals, and that that by itself is now I'm, I'm running into the issues of not having a medical degree, right? Mm. The study is great. The the people who worked on that study are actually people with PhDs. They're back in Bulgaria. I was able to to find some people that were willing to conduct the study for you know less money and and and, and, and they will be willing to deal with me. I mean, I first started to listen in the United States, but uh, like I said, every person that I approached, even though I was willing to pay for it, uh, to up to a degree, right? I'm not a rich person. Yeah, they, they, they will either give me an absorbent, they will either ask me for an exorbitant amount of money, and or sometimes both, they'll say, who are you working for? Who are you working with? And when I said, I work for myself, or I work by myself, uh, it did not go well <laughs> with, 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 not, with not a single person, right? The re- I either got blank stares with, from the people that I met with in person, or the response on the phone was just, was just awkward silence, saying like something isn't right. Like like you 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 either testing something illegal, or or so, something isn't right. We don't know of anybody who works by themselves. <laughs> well, you, this- you know all those grifters and and you know criminals going around trying to get studies done. You know who knows what your, right, your exactly. motivation is. Yeah, <laughs> what I'm up to. <laughs> He's a person who is. I mean, I I agree that it sounds strange, but just like you said, on the other hand, like, oh wow, you know, he seems like that guy, that type of guy who does these studies for criminal reasons, right? <laughs> um, anyways, it didn't work out. I wanted to do it here because it would have been easier for me uh, logistically, but it didn't work, right? So it didn't work out. So I went to started looking at Europe and China and um, found a lab in China. They're actually doing a second study. We'll talk about the DHT one in, in a minute. Um, so the Bulgarians did the study with Corino. You used hamster model, and basically the 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 disease was so called graphemurine leukemia. It's caused by a virus, and it's notorious in animal research uh, because it's known as the as the cancer that is one hundred percent transplantable. In other words, when you inject an animal with these cancer cells, not a single animal is able to resist. So it's, it's almost like you inject them with anthrax, right? If you inject mm. enough, they almost it's guaranteed to die, right? And it's also 100% lethal. So there, there are no known cases of spontaneous regression of this thing. And of course, there are no known cases of being cured because, you know, if you come up with something like that, that, you know, you, you'll be gone, in, at least in the, in, the, in the animal research world. Wow. So I said, okay, let's, let's, let's put it, let's stack cordon against this, this, this monster of, of a disease. Um, and we did the study, and basically the results are that, so we had two groups with Corino. One group got Corino for seven days before the tumor implantation was attempted, and then the second group uh, got Corino together with the tumor implantation. Okay. The, the group that got seven-day pre-treatment with Corino, they, these animals refused to get sick. <laughs> really? 
it yeah, it basically it took it took more than two weeks to get successful tumor implantation in these animals. While you can see, because there are graphs in the report I'll send you, while you can see that in the group that got nothing, within like the second day, all the animals were already infected, right? Hmm. And then like the, I was even I was I mean these people like the researchers even started calling me back saying like, are you like what's going on here? Like this 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 shouldn't be happening. Like what's inside? What what is inside that thing? Said so just whatever's on the label. Progesterone DHA. Like, why is this such a big deal? Oh, by the way, the regular cordon that we have right now, it, it has a three to one ratio of progesterone to DHA. We tested a version which is called Corinone Plus, which is the ratio to progesterone DHA is eight to one. Because one of the studies showed that for people with cancer, with animals with cancer, slightly higher amounts of progesterone are needed. Well, not slightly, but you know, like twice that amount that is in regular Corinone. Um, so once that study is published, We'll release that version, Cordinon Plus, as well on the open market for people to buy if they're interested. Anyways, long story short, it took so there was one animal in this in the Cordinon treated group with the pretreatment that did not get cancer until day 19. Wow, this is unprecedented, unprecedented. So, so the to the researchers because they're uh, this such is such a lethal uh, virus, such a lethal cancer. All their focus is on on treatment, right? They don't care about prevention. Uh, but to me, those results are actually much more important. We we care about prevention, right? And and you'll see in the report they were say they were stating basically that the the animals that were getting corinone were 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 essentially you know invisible. Like they kept injecting them, and they thought that they were making an error. Something with the injection was wrong. They weren't putting in enough tumor cells, uh, or maybe they weren't injecting it deep enough, or there was you know something else. But little by little, it became clear that it was the corinone. You know, the group that started getting the, the tumor together with the corinone, did a little worse. Not as bad, uh, uh, kind of in between, between the group that got nothing and the, 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 the group that got corinone as preventative measure. So corinone as prevention works, and it works tremendously well. And then after that, in terms of survival and in terms of metastasis, um, you, it, you can clearly see from the pictures because they dissect these animals and the pictures are in the report. You can see that the, the, the group that got uh, just the tumor, they were dead by like, I think day, maybe day 18, day 19. And then the group that got corinone pretreatment lived to like 62 days or something like that. So so more than three times extended their, the you know, the, the, the survivability of the animals. And the group that got corinone together with with uh, with the tumor treatment lived for about 50 days. So both both pretreatment and post treatment, or at least simultaneous treatment, uh, for people that I guess they could be already having cancer, both of these uh, uh, interventions were highly highly beneficial. Uh, but pretreatment mattered, and basically the the animals in the group that got pretreatment for seven days lived the longest, did not have metastasis. And they're basically their tumors grew at the slowest rate. And some of the at the end of the of the of the trial, actually, some of the animals got euthanized, but they weren't they weren't dead deadly ill. They weren't terminal. Hmm. And I try try to extend the study, but apparently, like, because you have to comply with ethical procedures. So what happens is that uh, after if if an if an animal loses a certain amount of weight. It's considered inhumane to continue the study. It's basically you're tormenting the animal. Oh. So the they they get euthanized by day sixty five whether whether they're sick or not right and I wanted to ex to extend this I said well why why can we keep these animals alive and you know you know, keep feeding them and see how long they're going to last for because like I said some of the animals did not have metastasis um, but you know you have to specify a period through which the study would last and at the end of the period the all the animals get killed whether you like it or not so there was a chance there is a good chance that maybe two of the animals and there were ten per group. Two of the animals in the coordinate pretreatment group would have survived much, much longer, potentially, you know, throughout their normal lifespan. Uh, they did have small tumors form, but no metastasis, and they seemed to be fine. They kept eating, you know, their blood was was okay. There were some very interesting metrics done on their blood. Uh, one of the groups over there in Bulgaria, the Bulgaria Academy of Sciences, who, who performed the study, they actually looked at the change in, in water structure. Uh, because we're about 70% water. They looked at the change in water structure and the energy levels of the hydrogen bonds of the water that is inside of our blood as a result of the administration of cortinone and comparing that to to basically to the patients with just with cancer. And they've already done extensive studies before that showing that 
the, the water becomes more bulky, less structured, just as Ray has written, in people with cancer. And in fact, you can use this change in water structure. That's the principle upon which the MRI machine operates. Hmm. Because the water is more bulky on an MRI image, uh, the, 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 the water in the tumor is more bulky. On an MRI image, that water appears in a darker color. So on an MRI image, the place where they call you, you have the tumor, that's actually the water inside the tumor that, that they are imaging. Regular tumor, if it's, if it's uh, completely calcified and has no water in it, it's actually harder to detect on an MRI image. They have to do an X-ray for that. But if you do an MRI and you see these areas, well-formed dark areas, that's usually the indication that a tumor is there. It's still metabolically active. He hasn't, he hasn't necrotized. Um, so it's kind of like, it's basically like this is a detectable tumor on MRI. So anyway, so cortisol uh, caused changes in the water structure as well and l- led to more structured water, less bulky water. So it's really interesting. I mean, I think yeah. you enjoy reading the report. Um, so now the goal is to fight the political battle and get it published because, again, the journals are saying, who is this guy, Georgie, and <laughs> what is his deal, <laughs> and why is he trying to do these things and publish things um, with stuff that we think should not have an effect, right? Because um, when, I mean, when I talk to the even the even the Bulgarians, most of the most of the people who did the study are doctors, and I had a few fights with them. The initially they actually didn't want to do this. They said this is crazy. Progesterone is a female hormone. DHA is an adrenal hormone. There is absolutely no way this would work for a hematological cancer because that's the this murine leukemia virus is causing it, it causes a type of leukemia yeah. in the in the cancers, right? And they were saying there is nothing published in the literature that would suggest. The progesterone and DHA would work for this. This is madness. Like, why are you do it? And that's, I mean, you can see the reactions. Like, you're spending money on this. There is zero evidence published that this would work. Yet you still want to go to go forward, right? And I said, yeah. So they did it, and now they're on my case. They're like, oh wow, <laughs> this thing works. Let's do more, right? I'm like, aha. <laughs> We'll see about that. So, so basically, you have this study, and there's a couple groups of mice, and one of those groups gets pre- yes, yes. pre-treated with cordonon. One of the groups right. gets cordonon at the same time as they get this, uh, this like basically Ebola, smallpox, anthrax virus that causes this deadly leukemia. Right. And right. you're looking at how long they're going to live. Was there a group that didn't get cordonon at all and just got the virus? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's the group that basically got sick by the second day, right? Yeah. They were, so they were the hundred percent transplantability, and there was the hundred percent effectiveness, if you want to, if you want to call it that way, because it was a virus, right? So it's a hundred percent effective, a hundred percent lethal. So the group that got nothing, only only the virus, yeah, he almost immediately developed, started developing tumors. So by the day two, they were already all infected. And how long? How and long then, did they live, basically? Uh, about about ten to twelve days. Uh, I mean, I'm forgetting the exact number, but it was. It was less than a third okay. than what the groups would call them. And the one who got it at the same time as the virus, they lived, you know, you said like 50 days. And then the ones who got pre- pre-treated, they lived, you know, two of them were still alive at the 62 end. 62 days. And, and two of them were still alive. And I wanted to keep the study going. But there is a protocol for ethical treatment yep, of animals, yep, gotcha. which prevents the study from con- continuing beyond a certain, certain level. Because they're saying, well, if it's only two animals, and by the way, because all the other animals are dead, right? They're also it also makes the study a little bit harder to control, right? So you have nothing to compare these animals to, right? If they if they're the only two animals surviving, yeah. then the study becomes almost entirely about survival, while the initial protocol and that's that's the other part that I don't like. Science is done in a very rigid way these days. You have to specify a protocol, even though I'm paying for the study, you have to agree to the protocol and then you have to stick with it, right? Yeah. Even if you discover that something may have kept these animals alive, not forever, but like would have made them live with their cancer as if it was a cold or a flu, I would, I'm not allowed to proceed with that study because it's violation of whatever ethical rules there are. And then even in this case, I'm not completely free. So they have to terminate by day 65. So given, given these results, what does that tell us about the structure of cancer You know that we, that we don't know? Well, at the very least, it tells us that cortisol or the immune system is heavily involved because uh, the two main Two of the two of the main features, two of the main benefits of progesterone and DHEA are the opposition of cortisol. Now, almost every patient with cortisol, and that that re, uh, relates to my initial fights with the professors who refused to do the study, or the Bulgarians, because I kept saying, look, yes, there is no specific evidence for progesterone and DHEA of this specific virus, 
because nobody has thought about doing it before, but there is plenty of evidence on the thymus gland getting obliterated in people with any kind of cancer, and in general, these people having suppressed immune system. And also, there's a ton of studies showing that progesterone and DHEA restore the immune system. They're saying, yes, but there's no causative link, right? It could be just a correlation. Maybe the cancer destroyed the immune system afterwards, and it's not it, it's not that a suppressed immune system leads to cancer. So, so we had these fights, but now that it's clear that cortisone works, that I think it lends credence to my position, which is, uh, restoring the effect, so the, the decline of the immune system is causative for the development of cancer, hence the cortisol effect, right? And then opposing cortisol, which it has the effect of restoring the immune system, is highly protective, both as a preventative and therapeutic measure. That's pretty great. I mean, that's that's uh, that's got some pretty heavy implications for sure. Um, and I wanted to do some blood study, uh, blood tests for these animals. That's another thing that the protocol prevented. Like you have to specify in advance what you want to test. And I wanted to test cortisol. I wanted to test, uh, basically, I, w- I wanted them to look at the thymus gland and measure like before and after, right? O- all of these things. None of that was possible because, uh, you know, for that, you have to do a special study. You have to involve people who deal strictly with the thymus gland. And when I try to get these two groups to talk to each other, they said no. Like there was some kind of a one group doesn't believe that what the other does is is legitimate, <laughs> so they they refuse to talk to each other. It's a political fight, and unfortunately, science has become politics. Yeah. So you mentioned in your email that you also had a DHT study you were looking at. Is is that uh, finished? I mean, can you talk about that at all? Yes. So it's still ongoing, and basically it has two phases. First of all, so the studies with prostate cancer. And specific type of prostate cancer, which unlike the cortinol study, cortinol study used a type of cancer that only happens in in marine animals. In other words, mice in in rodents like mice, rats, hamsters, etc. Right. Okay. So it doesn't have like one of the criticisms that we will get about this study, even when it gets published, hopefully, immediately oncologists will come back and say, "Great job, awesome," but guess what? It means nothing for people, right? Because they'll be like, "This is a strictly marine virus." Maybe there's something unique about it, right? There's mm. there's something that because you you know there's always this criticism that comes back after somebody publishes something um, inconvenient, and they're trying to poke holes in the study. And this, the one the one of the big holes would be this doesn't apply to people. Yeah, context. Right? First of all, you, right, you're using a, an animal model, right? And second, the actual tumor itself was not human. But guess what? Georgie knew that this criticism is coming and said, "I will do something even more controversial." I will I will do a study on an animal model which actually has human tu- human tumor, and by the way, those by now are considered pretty equivalent to a, to an actual person developing the same cancer because those are human cells and they're transplanted on an animal whose immune system, by the way, ironically, has to be suppressed because otherwise they'll reject the human cells, right? So in order to develop the human tumor to on an animal host, you have to suppress the host's immune system, right? But the tumor itself is fully human. It's human cells. So whatever results come out of that study, it will be directly applicable 100% to a human with the, with this specific prostate cancer. And you can divide the prostate cancers into generally two types, hormone-dependent and what they call the second one, which I, I, I really like that word, even though it's very sinister. They call it castration-resistant. Now, not many men with prostate cancer know that when they go to the doctor and get treatment for prostate cancer, not many men know that they're actually getting castration treatment. I mean, the doctor will purposely avoid using that word. There are special guidelines published by the FDA to avoid using these words because clearly, if that's if you approach the patient that way, they may be highly resistant, <laughs> highly exactly to to getting castrated. Yeah. Right. So if you go and say, and by the way, it used to be even more barbaric. Back in the 40s and 50s, there was physical castration as a standard of treatment. You you were really turning, you were being turned into a eunuch by by your, by a surgeon, and that was the treatment for prostate cancer. Of course, it didn't cure anybody, right? They all they all died still, right? But they were getting castrated in the process. So so real quick before we dive more into the study, just for people who don't know. Uh, DHT is a metabolite of testosterone. And for prostate cancer for men, a lot of times they will lower DHTA and other, uh, you know, testosterone metabolites in the belief that your prostate's basically getting bigger because of testosterone. Is that kind of a good summary? Yes. And now they've extended the DHT argument to pretty much any androgen. They're saying 
anything that's capable of activating the androgen receptor, and that's that's what uh, leads into my distinction between the two types of cancer, castration-resistant versus castration-sensitive, right? They're saying anything capable of activating the androgen receptor is likely to uh, help the tumor grow, right? So so now they're developing their, their drugs already approved on the market that actually don't target DHT specifically. They actually target the androgen receptor. Flutamide, flutamide and bicalutamide, these are two drugs that are very potent androgen receptor antagonists. In other words, testosterone also activates the, the androgen receptor. DHEA activates the androgen receptor. Androsterone. So in other words, these drugs are saying the approach of these, uh, of these drugs is, okay, so uh, let's let's cancel the whole thing. We're just going to block anything that tries to uh, uh, attach to this receptor and activate it, right? The, let's not even worry about DHT. Let's worry about anything capable of interacting with this receptor. And those drugs unsurprisingly, have not led to cures. I mean, in fact, they actually, recently they've been shown to lead, if you actually castrate this person, um, in about 30% of the cases, the cancer will progress into something called castration-resistant prostate cancer, and that is highly aggressive, and unlike the original prostate cancer, which most men are capable of living with it and, and not dying from it, they will die from natural causes, if you are, are unlucky enough to get the castration-resistant prostate cancer, it's highly aggressive, highly metastatic. Usually, like within a year or two, you're done, hmm. right? And that's what these therapies are leading to. And now they've actually started to uh, to recognize this. Even the mainstream oncology is starting to recognize this and saying, now they're, they're calling for this therapy. They're calling it like a androgen shock therapy. So now, <laughs> after castrating is successful, they'll say, wow, the tumor doesn't respond to these things anymore. Well, let's, let's kind of like... But somehow, somehow perversely administering an androgen, we know from preliminary clinical studies, it actually helps. So we're going to give it a little bit of androgen. This will shrink the tumor, but of course, the theory is that it will continue to kill you. So of course, androgens are still bad. So after about a week or two of giving you testosterone or whatever else we're doing, we're going to we're going to withdraw the therapy and still put you back on the castration therapy. So, so that's that's what they're doing. So, so you're saying that there's these two types of prostate cancer, and by treating people with castration, it actually turns the prostate cancer in a certain percentage of men into the castration-resistant killer exactly. prostate cancer. Exactly. Exactly. Highly metastatic, highly aggressive. Basically, nothing is known to work for it. If you get if you get to that level, um, chances are that they're, they're kind of starting to focus on quality of life, which is another way of them saying you're terminal, right? Get your affairs in order, and there isn't much we can do for you, right? But for that specific cancer, even though they call it castration resistant, there are individual studies, which you may have seen on the, I posted on the forum, that injecting testosterone directly into the prostate of these people, keep in mind that it's not supposed to work because they're saying this is now castration resistant. This, this cancer should not be reacting to either androgen agonists, which is DHT and testosterone, or androgen antagonists, which are the castration drugs. They're saying nothing should work. Mm. Yet, when they injected men with terminal prostate cancer, castration-resistant cancer, when they injected their prostates directly with testosterone, every single one of these people had their cancers disappear. Wow. Yet, somehow, yeah, I'll send you the studies. They, they said disappear, did not shrink, did not go into remission. Their cancer disappeared together with the metastasis. So why isn't this front page news. Do you understand the significance of this thing? So basically for the last 80 years, all these men, tens of millions of men have died being told that androgen is evil, that they need to be turned into uh, hermaphrodites or eunuchs or whatever term you prefer in order for them to survive. Yet of course, 30% of them don't survive at all. And they die actually pretty quickly if uh, compared to if they had uh, no, no treatment whatsoever. And still the majority of these people like will die when they're getting the castration treatment. And now we're finding that it's the exact opposite that seems to be true. Hmm. Giving these men more androgens, so in other words, like a, like a, like a, in a simplistic analogy, uh, just to give you an example, would be like, what if androgens were therapeutic and not carcinogenic? That's really where the evidence is going towards. So I'm, and I said, okay, let's see if that's truly the case. Now, of course, I didn't come out, didn't come up with this, with this idea strictly out of because I'm a conspiracy theorist. I, I think the evidence alone given presently sufficient to think that way but i had some specific evidence that showed directly that administering androgens is therapeutic one of them actually two of them are the studies that i just mentioned injecting men with prostate cancer with testosterone cured it didn't put in remission i'm repeating this because it's very important yeah. didn't 
We didn't manage it, didn't make it better quality of life or whatever. It cured it. Of course, the response from the from the, uh, from the oncologist was, well, testosterone converts into estrogen. So it was estrogen that was therapeutic. Oh, it wasn't the testosterone, right? And I'm saying, okay, now any person, now of course I'm a layman and I cannot argue this publicly, but any person who's gone through an endocrinology course, or at least urology, will know that the main function of the prostate is to produce dihydrotestosterone, DHT. It has the highest expression of the enzyme, 5-alpha reductase, than any other organ, except possibly for the brain. So if you inject the, the prostate with a precursor to DHT, which testosterone is, the vast majority of that of that precursor will be converted into DHT. The, the, uh, the, the prostate does not express much of the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone into estrogen. So they're still using this argument, which is absurdly low probability, that testosterone worked because you see it was converted somehow into estrogen, and that's how it, because they didn't, they didn't do any measures. They didn't, they didn't check the hormone changes of these men that were getting injected. They were, they were terminal, so they were just trying to improve their quality of life or they were involved in this experimental study. But clearly somebody out there thought that giving these men testosterone would be therapeutic. Otherwise, why do it, right? Somebody must have thought, Oh, well, the same lines like me, and I said, let's let's extend this. Let's take this. Let's take this a step further. And this is a field. This is an area which only I can do. Only an independent researcher who does not have a career that's that's being bet on the idea that androgens are you know are are killing you, and you need to castrate people to cure them. Mm-hmm. A regular doctor with a medical degree will not be allowed to do a study with DHT. And I said, let's take the testosterone study. And let's kill the argument that estrogen is the beneficial thing here. How do we do that? Let's administer a hormone that does not convert into estrogen. And not only that, let's administer the very hormone, which to this day, medicine claims is the cause, not one of the causes, the cause of prostate cancer. Now, if that study comes back with the results that I've kind of so far looking the way I'm expecting them to do, then medicine has no recourse other than attacking me, uh, the attack in the study is fraudulent. Uh, one way or another, basically, we're, we're looking at, at a collapse, hopefully, of this entire charade. And unfortunately, there will probably be class action lawsuits uh, st- springing up because there is no excuse for doing the 180 degree opposite therapy of what was supposed to be useful. Right? Yes. That's tens of millions of men so, so these mice uh, in, in your study are getting DHT um, and you're saying it's not done yet, but it's promising? Do you, I mean, do you have anything kind of, any specifics on that? Yes. So the, there, were two, there were two phases to that study. The first phase was they were testing toxicity. Um, the second, the study is done in China, in Taiwan actually, more specifically. Um, so the lab, what it does, like I send them the components the, it's basically the same product, almost the same product as Corino. The solvent is the same. It's vitamin E and a little bit of fat. But the, you know, the one of the experimental components is DHT. And the study needs to, in order to be legitimate, and I try to do it as legitimate as possible, the study actually uses something called standard standard of care, standard standard of treatment. And for basically for this specific prostate cancer. It is a type, is a synthetic type of selenium compound. It's called methyl selenol. So that's what the lab recommended is using a standard of care to compare the therapeutic effects. So there are four groups. One group control, and all they get is, is the, the the cells from the human tumor implanted on top of an immunocompromised mass. Uh, second group, I also wanted to test corinone because I suspect that it will work there too. Second group, corinone. Same dosage as the one for the for the uh, murine leukemia study, right? Third group, standard of care, which is methyl selenol. Fourth group, DHT at a human equivalent dosage of about 15 milligrams daily. That just that happens to be about the dose of DHT which has been used in the past on humans. Um, they they admit that they when they measured like the the administered dosage resulted in an absorption of about 10 milligrams per day. But I you know, I had a reason to go to a little bit more because I, there were some animal studies on which I based my hunch that, you know, slightly higher dosage would, would work even better, specifically for prostate cancer. So the last group is nothing but DHT and at a dose of about equivalent to humans for about 10 to 15 milligrams daily, depending on the weight of the actual human. Now, the first study tested toxicity. So uh, basically, they, they would implant some of these um, some, some of these mice with a tumor, right? And then for about for three days, they would administer 
you know, because one group is control, has no, it gets nothing except water yeah. and food, and, and the other three are getting these components. And they want to see if there's anything in these components that will immediately kill these mice because they're immunocompromised, right? They're highly susceptible to infections and whatnot, right? So, um, so basically, they tested corinone, this, and th these two things. Not only did, did none of the mice die, but if one of the mice in the methyl selenol group, standard of care, died. And another one, basically, um, he had its tumor balloon to the point of where they had to euthanize the mice. So two out of ten mice dead. One on its own. Uh, this is standard of care treatment. Yeah. Um, and then the other one, the tumor becomes so big so fast over three days that, again, due to ethical reasons, they had to euthanize it. None of the mice in the corinone groups and the DHT groups died. Not only that, but their appetite increased, which in cancer is a huge, huge sign of things going well. Like many patients with cancer, they have very poor appetite for a number of reasons. They're in a catabolic state. They have high ammonia levels. Cortisol is high. If cortisol is high, your appetite is suppressed, right? So, again, cortisol fully expected to oppose cortisol, fully expected to increase appetite. But DHT did even better. So the mice that were, that were taking DHT for this short-term toxicity study, they ate more than even the cortisol mice. So now we're in the phase where we'll see what happens with survival, metastasis, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually starting as we speak right now. It's starting starting today. That's awesome. And it will go for about three weeks, and then we'll know what happens. And, I mean, I would, I, if, if the results are good, I will not even wait for this to be published. I will post it in the forum, send it to you, because the news needs to, needs to spread fast. Um, there are many people out there who are currently getting castrated as we speak, they're getting all of these different therapies that are at, at best not doing anything for them beneficially and, and at worst, uh, you know, greatly accelerating the decline and death of the patient. So for the regular person, basically what they can take away from this is don't get prostate cancer therapy. I mean, what, what can the regular person take away? Right. So one of the studies on which I based this idea, uh, uh, they, had, they had several groups and one of the, one of the mice that uh, they were studying got estrogen therapy. Now, the mice with the estrogen therapy uh, had their tumors grow the fastest from the highest number of metastases, and they died the quickest. So even that group was based in Sweden. And when I when I tried to talk to, talk to them, they didn't want to discuss it publicly. They said, we can only do it on the phone. They, so I said, well, look, you do understand that estrogen is currently a therapy for prostate cancer because it's one of the castration methods, right? If you administer to a, a high dose of estrogen to a male, you will, you're effectively castrated. And they said, yeah, we know. So given the results, what do you think should be done? They said, don't get estrogen treatment. Hmm. Okay, uh, how about we go a step further? Would you say that it would be good to lower estrogen for a person who already has prostate cancer? I said, absolutely. I said, well, why would you say that? I said, have you looked at the literature? I said, yeah. There are a ton of studies demonstrating that estrogen is also involved. Yet somehow, in the official dogma that basically made it to human treatment, estrogen is never mentioned as a cause, only as treatment. This is one of the castration treatments. And so there, these are these are MDs, these are the doctors in established institutions in Sweden. They said, so I asked, I can ask them the same question. I said, what do you think this means? They said, well, what do you think it means? I said, I think personally that first of all, you should be refusing estrogen treatments if you have prostate cancer. Second of all, that you should be testing your estrogen and prolactin, which is a good surrogate for estrogen. And if they're high or above, you know, the, the, the range where you really should be, then you should be doing everything possible to lower. They said you're spot on, but don't quote us on this. Um, so that will be my takeaway from their study. And now, if my study comes back successful, it will be in. It will be it will be impossible to argue at least biochemically that estrogen is good because one of the effects of DHT therapy is to tank estrogen levels to the ground to levels that they cannot be detected on blood tests. So. So if these mice do the best, which is what I'm expecting will happen, then the it's hard to argue that tanking estrogen is beneficial for your prostate cancer. In other words, you'll be, I mean, it won't be good for the cancer, it'll be good for you and work against the cancer. So I want to kind of shift gears um, to uh, science in general and studies uh, and that kind of thing. So to a lot of people out there, you know, science is kind of like this god. Um but in your, you know, yeah. your experience, you've probably read thousands of studies. Um, it's not, you know, there's about maybe a lot of fraud going on, or maybe the emperor has no clothes. So, can you kind of expand on your experience in this department? Are you familiar with a researcher called Ioannidis? Uh, I'm not. He's a Greek doctor, but he has a joint professorship at Harvard University. 
um, in, a, in a Greek university. So he, he's originally Greek, but he works and lives about six months in the United States and another six months in Greece. So his work is statistical analysis of the reliability of medical studies. And he proved with another study, which now you get into a paradox if you apply his results to his own study, that more than 80% of all studies out there are flat out wrong. Like he doesn't go that much into detail about whether they're fraudulent, whether they're, you know, they, they kind of like exaggerated the results or, you know, they spared a few inconvenient details. He just says flat out wrong. In other words, look at the conclusions, whatever the conclusions are, 80% of them should be just thrown out completely without any discussion. Um, and then in the remaining 20%, he's saying that about 60% of those remaining 20%. So right off the bat, we're looking at more than 90% of studies being either flat out wrong or unreliable to the point that you cannot rely on their conclusions. You should be, so for the studies that weren't wrong, then you should be looking at the actual full study and reading very carefully the section on materials and methods, what assumptions they had how the animals were treated, what food they used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because in, when it, once you look into the details, you will often realize that the conclusions that were reached at the end are the exact opposite of what the actual data shows, right? And and sometimes some, some of the conclusions are actually not due to the whatever the current theory they're trying to validate or invalidate, but through some peripheral factor, such as the way the animals are treated, the food they're taking, um, the dosages that are being administered, et cetera, et cetera. And in the tiny 20% remaining of the studies that were not wrong, the vast majority had a very strong political agenda. In other words, um, if you look at the uh, the groups that performed the study, um, it was it, he, he could not find, this guy, Ioannidis, Dr. Ioannidis, he could not find a single study by a well-established group that kind of went against what, what the group's core message was. In other words, if you work looking at prostate cancer studies, and this group has been pub publishing how this estrogen is really the best thing on, you know, under the sun for your cancer, you will not find a study from this group that says, oh, you know what, we're kind of wrong. And we have his experience and the experience of most people in the field as practitioners is that very few things in nature are completely black and white, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the, the, right off the bat, there is this suspicion that we're getting fed uh, you know, certainty in an uncertain world. That's what these people do. They sell they sell certainty in an uncertain world in the hopes of justifying further funding from whoever is funding them, um, pleasing their sponsor, because many times now actually the majority of the funding doesn't come from the government. Used to. Now it's actually this like private, public-private collaboration or academia collaborating with the drug industry. And basically, if, a, if, far, if Pfizer, if you're working for the university, if Pfizer is paying a lot of money for you to study their drug, there is there is an almost insurmountable bias and and sort of like a you know um, unwritten rule that you do not publish studies that that make the you know the drug that Pfizer is pushing look bad. You just don't do that, right? I mean, you, you, and if you do, then then you don't publish these studies. You send them to Pfizer, and then you decide what to do. Now, up until 2017, the the federal rules were such that. The, these studies were exempt from federal regulations. In other words, if it's private funding, and if it's, then it's between you and the university, you mean the pharmaceutical company. So if the university calls you and says, hey, look, uh, we're really not getting these good results from this chemical, um, what should we do? Now, this could be or, an already approved drug. So you, your group could have uncovered, the university group may have uncovered toxicity from this, from this chemical, may have uncovered evidence that strongly questions the efficacy now, if this is an already approved drug by the FDA, this is your cash cow as a pharmaceutical company. You will not want anything to come out that endangers this, right? And there is nothing requiring you to report these negative findings or to even mm. publish them, right? So that's what has been happening up until 2017. And in 2017, FDA kind of managed uh, to pass rules, which are still most companies are not compliant with them, but at least they're on paper. That if, if this is a human study, it doesn't matter who funds it. It has to be registered. There's a special database called clinicaltrials.gov. It's like a public website where you all the studies listed, the parameters are listed, the fund, the people in the organizations funding it are listed. You have to you have to state your protocol, and you have to state your 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 expected results in advance. Not wait for the data to come out. And then formulate a hypothesis based on the data, kind of like fit fit your conclusions based on the results that you're getting, right? You should be 
if this is if this is something that's especially if it's an established drug that the FDA has already approved, actually you have to notify FDA. If you do, even if you do, you know, so far the requirement is only on humans, right? But now the, there's a proposition that you also have to do this if you're doing it on animals as well. So let's give an example. Uh, the statin drugs are probably the most highly, the widely, the most widely prescribed drugs in the world. Uh, there are many studies with humans that are raising serious questions about the safety of these yep. drugs. And up until 2017, there was no requirement to post the results of these studies, to publish the results of these studies. And now the rules are, okay, you don't have to publish them, but you have to notify the FDA because we want to know, right? If you uncovered through through your private research that, that a drug that we approved is actually not what, what you know, what, what the approval claims to be, right? Maybe, I mean, look, every tr- clinical trial is limited. Maybe the original group wasn't large enough, but you uncover something later that makes this drug look bad. You have to you have to let us know. And and now they're saying, and now they're proposing, the FDA is proposing requirements where you will have to notify them even if you're doing studies, privately funded studies with animals. Uh, up until now, the, the pharmaceutical industry has been able to get away to, from like from blame by saying, even if, if there's a negative result from a statin drug or in a rat model, they'll say, oh, this is in rats, don't worry. I mean, FDA approved it in humans. We, we keep testing in rats for different reasons. And even if the, the results are not good, you have to you have to go by what the FDA says. And FDA kind of says, uh, you know what? We don't want you, we kind of don't like this, you know, this whole responsibility being shifted towards us. You should be sharing some of the responsibility. So we want you to now tell us what you find out in regards to that drug, no matter who tests it on your behalf, you know, even if it's internal in your own lab, we want to know. That's that's the requirement. Otherwise, you're risking of you know getting your the approval for this drug yanked. And potentially, you know, fines, criminal charges, whatnot. So it's a step in the right direction. But as of right now, 80% of all studies are flat out wrong. And of the remaining 20%, um, basically a good 10 to 12% are highly exaggerated and have political factor behind them. And the remaining are basically the gold standard, the so-called double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials, of which about 25%, according to Ioannidis, 25%, should should not have had the conclusions which were officially published. In other words, when he looked at the material methods, when he looked at all of the components of the study, the assumptions, the treatments, like the the peripheral factors, the the conclusion in about in about a quarter of the gold standard of pharmaceutical industry, double blind randomized control, should not have been reached the way the way they were published. So. I, I, I found something very similar, actually. Uh, when I was doing research on uh, SSRIs, uh, basically, you know, they just didn't publish half the studies that said that they didn't work effectively. And so it looks great, you know, uh, your antidepressant looks great when you just don't publish or, you know, use those studies in the, th- in the thing. But, but yeah. I, you know, I use studies for this podcast all the time, and I know the media, they post articles with new studies in them. So you're basically saying that 80 to 90% of those are probably not true hogwash 80 percent are fully not true 80 percent are should be thrown out in the trash right now as we speak the other the remaining 20 percent of that at least half is heavily skilled heavily biased yeah. right and what remains is the gold standard about let's say less than 10 percent is the gold standard the double blind randomized placebo control trials with humans which are heavily regulated they have to they undergo this, these tremendous they're really heavily restricted and they're very expensive. It costs about, uh, you know, a bi- up to a billion dollars to push a drug to all the clinical trials that are required for approval. So of those gold standards that all the drugs that are in the circulation mm. right now, they all have to ha- have undergone a clinical trial. Of those 10%, one quarter, in other words, 2.5%, are basically reach conclusions that are not justified based on the raw results from the study or based on other factors inside that study that looked at, you know, the, the selection of the of the population. In other words, maybe you didn't, like the study says, oh, great, this statin is amazing, it prevents heart disease. Yeah, but you biased, you selected your group of patients in a very biased way. And pharmaceutical companies do this all the yeah. time, right? So it's not outright fraud, but it's like it's like pushing pushing the boundaries in a way that really creates a result that's not justified by one or more factors that went into preparing it's that like study. It's like soft fraud. So th- this leads, exactly, it leads about 7.5% at most of anything published out there 
about seventy and a half, seven and a half percent that is somewhat reliable, right? Somewhat. Why do I say somewhat? So your analysis didn't go into that, but I've looked at how many of the studies that are actually do look legit, and uh, you know, not many people have complained about them. How many of these studies have problems? And I found out, and I posted this on the forum that one of the gold, one of the one of the unicorns lately of pharmaceutical uh, research, uh, the drug called Zarelto which is a drug to, to prevent and treat blood clots in people, was actually based on directly fraudulent data that the FDA knew was coming out of several clinical centers um, in Mexico and other Latin American countries. So guess what? Pharmaceutical companies are like any other company. They'll try to keep their costs low. So they'll outsource many of these trials to third world, to, third, to countries where the regulation is, is lax, mm. is, is more relaxed, right? And in theory, FDA should be controlling these sites, should be inspecting them. But guess what? They can't. FDA is not God, right? FDA cannot cover the entire world. FDA relies on third-party vendors to do inspections and and basically to 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 um, produce reports that are reliable. Whether whether this clinical site is really reliable or whether something nefarious is going on there. Well, the <laughs> blockbuster drug Zarelto apparently was approved based on data that the FDA was subsequently told after the approval that it was fraudulent because several of the centers manufactured data on the effects of Zarelto out of thin air. There were no there were there weren't even any groups in those studies. Uh, there weren't even any people in those centers that actually took the drug. It was completely fake. They they got payment, they claimed they had patients enrolled, and then they had these people sitting there and concocting data out of thin air and saying, yes, this is how the group responded. Um, and when the FDA was notified, they refused to comment. And I think now there is a pending lawsuit but from a patient group by a patient group who is representing people taking Zarelto. They're asking the FDA to, at the very least, put a black box warning on Zarelto and say, um, you know, there's serious doubt about the validity of the data that went that was used to approve the drug, or at worst, yank it and basically pull it from market and say you have to redo the whole study, or at least redo the portions that were done in countries. Uh, that we knew, like completely manufactured data. It wasn't just skewed data. It was, the patients were were simply not there. So, so what can people do? I mean, are there signs that you can look for that that might suggest you're reading a fake study or, or reading a good study? Um, yes, I think there are. First of all, sponsor studies. I think that even the UNI, this research own said that uh, in his when he looked when he he tried to break down the different studies and correlate their reliability with various factors. He found that the strongest negative correlation with, uh, with reliability was uh, privately sponsored research. In other words, if, if you go by the data, if you look at a study that's been sponsored by one or more uh, companies, especially if they have vested interest in sponsoring the study, in other words, company push, producing the drug or selling the drug or marketing the drug, they're not always, they're not always the same company, mm. right? If any, any of these factors are present, then chances are the study is unreliable. At the very least, the conclusions are are, are likely heavily skewed in favor of the drug. Um, and I, I think the much simpler, much much more simple principle of protection would be caution. The only true test of a drug is experiment in time. The one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, had this line that anything in life takes pressure and time. Yeah. Right, almost like the that guy that dug through a tunnel for for ninety yeah. years. He had he had plenty of time. And all he all he had to do is push with this tiny hammer against the soft yeah. wall. So pressure and time. Get busy living or get busy dying. Get busy dying exactly. So so in this case, uh, you, uh, there, there are studies on that as well. It takes about two decades of a drug being in circulation because your true test is the general population. So no matter what the pharmaceutical company does, even if they're well, uh, in, the intentions are good. There's always the risk of that your sampling did not work properly and you selected a biased group, right? So the true test really is start selling it to the general population and then as, as the reports of side effects and case studies start to trickle in, little by little, you get you get an idea of what this drug really does. So unfortunately, um, short of saying don't use new drugs for at least a decade after they have come out, I don't think there's any shortcut. I mean, that's that's really that's really that's the test of life. Um, that's the only thing that can that can that can uh, oppose the tendency for fraud, exaggeration, political games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that's coming out of the private industry. Gotcha. 
So let's shift gears again. Um, whenever I interview someone who has a background in using Ray Pete's principles, I always ask about them. So uh, I, I usually ask, what do you think Ray gets right and what Ray gets wrong? So what, what do you think Ray gets right? Uh, I think the, the, the idea of metabolism being paramount for disease is unassailable. Um, I mean, if it, th- there's there are so many groups. And if you look at the stuff that I post on the Ray Pete forum, I mean, these are things corroborating Pete's ideas, but they're coming out from groups all over the world. Uh, the vast majority of these people haven't even heard of Pete. I mean, I've, I've reached out to them. I've said, you know, hey, have you know, do you know about this guy? Do you know about his theories? Do you know about this or that? And in the vast majority of cases, the answer is no. I mean, we've always worked with metabolism. And in our field, and they're, of course, they're working a specific for in regards to a specific disease, right? They're saying, let's say Alzheimer's. I mean, the groups that I've talked to, they said, Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease, uh, plain and simple. There's there's no zero doubt about it. So all I do is when I look at the medical field as a whole, then I started to see that there is a group in every disease you can imagine so far, at least the top 20 diseases that are, that are responsible for, let's say, 95% of the of the of the uh, pathological deaths deaths of people. It, there's a group, at least one group per per disease, which works in the metabolic field and says. Look, hey, people, we have serious evidence that metabolism is key, right? So it's not about what Pete gets right. I, I don't think it's his idea. He actually synthesized things in a very uh, accessible and unique and approachable way. Um, but these ideas have been going on for at least 150 years. Um, the, there's a book called The Cold War in Biology, uh, which Danny Roddy also mentions on several of his shows. And he talks about how the medicine kind of like uh, during the Cold War, there was also a Cold War in medicine hmm. as well. And it's the... Western idea that supported genes and the Eastern idea, in other words, not just the Soviet Union, but also also the the Asian countries with their idea of internal energy, like qi, yeah. right? Yin and yang, right? So it was the West battling the battling the East in every possible way, and this this sort of spilled in also into medicine and science. So there was it was a political fight from the very beginning. And we only got to hear mostly, uh, not only, but mostly got to hear one version of it. And now when this version is no longer producing results, in other words, the genes are responsible for diseases, um, we, have to, we have to look at, at new things. And well, they're not new. We have to look at the other side, right? Um, and I think what Pete has been doing is just simply being the proponent of the other idea over the last, you know, over the 20th century when most people had not even heard of it. So that's really what, what I think what makes him come across is, you know, he's uh, throwing these wild ideas out there. They're not wild. If you actually go and read Russian literature or Chinese literature or Indian literature in English, you will see that these are principles that have been there for ages. They're not mm-hmm. new. Um, so I, I think what he does, what he gets right is that um, the, at this point, the, I think the, the, the opinion, at least the medical opinion is even on hardcore geneticists is that genes directly probably do not cause disease. At best, they may make you more susceptible, right? But but there's no gene so far that's been discovered, not even a group of genes, not even a gene-to-gene interaction has been discovered, a unique one that's responsible for a specific disease. Um, excluding things like Down syndrome yeah. and potentially Huntington disease. There's some things that are clearly, clearly genetic, but they're probably like, you can count them on the fingers of, of both hands. And I think what Pete gets right, or at least is very good at, at promoting or publicizing, is that, A, for the vast majority of diseases that matter to us, that kill the majority of society, all of the deaths that are basically based on a disease, due to a disease, genes do not matter. What matters is your environment. What matters is what you eat. Now, and and, and I think another message that, that unfortunately, that's probably part of the, one of the stuff, he does, not that he gets wrong, but I don't, I don't think he emphasizes enough, is that, I don't think he's done a good enough job in, in showing people that just because something is hereditary doesn't mean it's genetic, hmm. right? And I think if he spends more time on that, I think that would be uh, – that would demonstrate to people it would actually be a very strong exposure um, of something that, that the genetic field has been using as an argument uh, in their favor. They're saying, look, nobody can deny that schizophrenia runs in the family. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's genetic, Right. And there are a ton of studies showing uh, recently about the epigenetic inheritance of even minor things like a, like a fear of a certain smell or sound. Now, what they did is there were basically um, 
they raised uh, two groups of rats, right? And one group of rats was never exposed to a cat, right? And then, and then they, they produced offspring. And there was another group of rats, and they were, on a daily basis, they were allowed to smell cat urine, and they were, allowed, they were basically placed in a cage next to a cat. So the cat would hiss at them, or like try to swipe at them, or try to like basically yeah. eat them, right? So the, the rats are pretty astute into noticing that this is not a friendly organism. <laughs> like if it if it gets access to us, yeah, we're done, yeah. right? Guess what? They transferred that fear to their progeny. So what they did afterwards was basically they took the progeny of the group that was never exposed to a predator, and then the progeny that was exposed to the smell of cat urine and the actual predator, right? And they looked at the progenies of the two groups, and they exposed them to cat urine. Now, keep in mind, the progeny has never yeah. seen cats. They're, they're you know, brand new. The, the group that was descended from rats that were exposed to the cat immediately developed anxiety disorder just by being exposed to the smell of urine, right? The other group could not care less. In fact, they tried to lick it like because it's salty, right? It has some yeah. ammonia in it. They tried to drink it. They, they, they behaved as if it was just some liquid that deserves exploration but not fear. The group that was exposed to the predator, I mean, their parents were cowered in fear, you know, went, went into the corner of the cage and basically refused to go near the corner of the cage where the cat urine was. They had never seen a predator. They simply smelled it through their through their ancestors. So so it's studies like this, and this has been extended now. There are actually extensive studies of Holocaust survivors showing that basically their, their descendants had dramatically higher rates of diabetes heart disease, depression, schizophrenia, like all kinds of cancer, right? All of these diseases that are, that according to mainstream medicine, have a heavily genetic component. Now, of course, the response from the genetics is like, hey, look, the population that went to the concentration camps was, was not randomly selected. You know what? That may be true, but there were tens of millions of them. And the if anything, the weight of the argument is on our side, saying that it's more likely than, than not that this was transferred, you know, this disease risk was transferred because of their experience in the concentration camps than because of whatever genes you people claim they're carrying that's making them Yeah, and, and you're so not going to get... At some point... You're not going to get a huge genetic change, right, in just, you know, one one generation. So, I mean, like those mice, it's not like any genes change. It's just what they're exposed to that's being transferred to the kids. So it's all environmental. They, they, they even measure it. Right, they, they, actually, they actually looked at the genome and they confirmed there was no mutation, right? The mice were strictly carrying a combination of the parents' genes and that's it. There was no mutation. Now, what did change was the methylation pattern, which is basically the like the, their methyl groups attached to a specific position on the DNA strand and they silence or act like the presence of a methyl group silences a gene and the absence activates a gene. So in other words... You can think of genes as um, what should I call them? Like like these these pipes. Water can water can come out of them or not, depending on whether you have a plug. So the methyl group acts like the mm. plug. So and so you can have a, this collection of pipes, and you can think of your body as being basically a, a pool, which is the result of mixing of all the water from the pipes that are not plugged, right? And then depending on how you plug the different pipes, you know you can plug all of them or some of them, right? You get basically a different exposure, a different, different, a different organism. I mean, it's still genetically the same, but the way it's going to react to certain things environmentally, the way it's going to be susceptible to certain diseases and uh, or not, right? It depends on how these genes are activated and and or deactivated, and that's and that's actually be that's hereditary. You can pass it on to the next so generation. So I, I interviewed Travis Birch. Uh, probably about a month ago and I asked him the same question you know what does Ray get white right what does he get wrong and one of the things he said was he found that hormone supplementation uh, you know just didn't work for some people and he actually put forth this theory that maybe hormones worked different in the 1900 like 1950s versus how they worked today I mean is do you find that at all in your experience so I would agree with his statement uh, on change because that's actually how nature is supposed to work. And that actually still leads back to the idea that the genes cannot be a correct idea because they imply non-change. Once you have your genes, you set, that's it. Nothing can be done. Nothing can be changed unless you experience a random mutation, right? Yet we've been noticing that nature actually changes dramatically over the course of even a few decades, let alone 100 or even 200 years, and many things that were true in the past are probably not true today. Now, I, I can certainly 
I've seen things like this happen. In fact, since you brought up the antidepressants, I will send you a nice article, which to this day, this line from the article stands, uh, it's, it's like emblazoned into my mm -hmm. brain. One of the researchers, so initially when they published the studies with the antidepressants, they found an extremely robust effect. And over time, uh, the, the, the basically the effect diminished in size. And one of the researchers is claimed, oh my God, it's like nature is trying to get back the results that it originally allowed us to access. And now it's trying to take them back. That's actually the quote from the study. Mm, interesting. Um, so I think it's definitely possible. Uh, I think there's, there's a ton that we don't know about nature and how things work. Um, I think that the hormones may have worked differently in the 1900s because people's hormonal profile was very different at the time. Uh, we are exposed to uh, like a, a tremendous amount of endocrine disruptors these days, both chemical and physiological things like electromagnetic waves, right? Yeah. Ionizing radiation, all of these things. So yeah, if if our hormonal profile profile is very different than what it was in the 1900s, at the very least, I would expect a dramatically different response to hormonal supplementation. But in the 1900s, they didn't have that many hormones to supplement with, so it's hard to assess based on the data that was available there at, at that time. How exactly they reacted to to because to keep keep in mind most hormones weren't isolated until the early 20th century. So in the 19 in the 1800s, which is the 19th century, I'm I'm pretty sure they did not have pure pregnenolone. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they did not have testosterone. They did not have any of these hormones. They actually were administering extracts from glands or distillates from like urine or blood or other like or, or other other uh, derivatives of biological tissue or biological material that physicians notice that have a specific effect. But as far as the effects of isolated hormones in the 19th century, I mean, I agree with Travis's uh, uh, statement that it's, it was probably different, mm -hmm. right? But I would not go as far as to claim is that they don't work. And, 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 and his justification is like, oh, look, that's what happened in the, in the 19th century. We, nobody administered pure pregnenolone in the, in the 19th century or pure testosterone or pure estrogen. It was all like, like more crude, right? More practical. People were care, people care at the time doctors care about curing somebody or actually you know getting them back to like a functional state, right? Now it's a lot more abstract. Now it's about, oh, this molecule, this receptor, and that's what we think it does, right? So science has kind of moved away from practicality, which is which is bad, I think. It, it, like as a net effect is not good. Science should still start with radical experimentalism and then try to build its theories based on that, right? But now we get the opposite. Now we're getting these beautiful theories developed in labs with very little rationale behind them, very little physiological material rationale behind them. And then they try to apply these theories back to the world. And if something doesn't work, they either suppress the evidence or don't publish it. Or in general, it has become a political idealized process where ideas fight for dominance and not results. Yeah, you, you want everything to be pragmatic, right? You want everything to apply. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, think about it. Why go to the doctor? What is the purpose of the doctor? It moved away from let me try to cure you or at least try to get you to feel better into let me provide a service. Let me let me manage you, like your symptoms or your disease, right? So it's almost like you, you've outsourced the management of a, of a problem to a third party whose goal at this point is actually kind of antithetical to curing it, even if you don't believe in conspiracy theorists. If, if the disease rates drop by 20%, let's say cancer, you will have a lot of unemployed oncologists. And guess what? These people cannot really change to another profession. They spend 15, 20 years studying extremely intricate and specialized things that make them uh, almost, almost incapable of doing anything outside of a very narrow subset of the medical field. These people cannot even become general practitioners anymore because they spend the last two decades studying nothing but a uh, you know, peculiar gene or, or something else related to a specific cancer, maybe even like a subset of a specific cancer. So that that's what this specialization has led to, to, a, to an abstraction of science and to, you know, eventually uh, dis destroying its effectiveness. Yeah. So when I was doing research for this interview, uh, one person mentioned that you had rarely talked about dental health. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but do you have any opinions or protocols on dental health that you found uh, particularly effective? Yes, uh, actually, many people don't know, and there's a study I posted on that, that most very competitive athletes have extremely poor dental health. And it will be, you know, when I say this and when I show the when I show the evidence, which at this point is being confirmed in pretty much every country around the world, so we know it's not genetic, right? At least 
strobium was the strobium because it's not genetic. And then the, the question is, okay, so what, what could be causing this? Um, again, most people don't know, but many competitive athletes are hypothyroid to the point where there is even a special medical term for female athletes. It's called the female athletic athletic triad. It's a specific. It's a it's a set of symptoms that female competitive female athletes develop, which is amenorrhea. They don't have a period, infertility, and and often mental disease. Hmm. Right. Um, and I'll give you a specific example with a male athlete, Michael Phelps. Um, and a, many many star athletes don't talk about their their problems because you would kind of you would tarnish the image of them being invincible and better yeah, than totally. us and being superhumans, right? It's, it's 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 really it's like it's a very bad idea to talk bad stuff about your especially commercial if you have sponsors because that's what they are. <laughs> yes, exactly. Especially if you have sponsors. So not many people probably know that Michael Phelps is actually a very uh, he's a, he's a clin- he suffers from clinical alcoholism. He got busted multiple times for DUI. Of course, Maryland police is keeping it under wraps, mm. etc. But the records are out there, and only recently he basically admitted that he's been um, he's been to rehab four times, and I think two of the times were involuntary. The judge basically told him, "You go to rehab or, or you go to jail." Like you, it, it's been too much, even for us, even for for you as a hero and uh, and this icon of of, of of athleticism, it's too much. Uh, we cannot tolerate this anymore. You're out of control. And and he attributes his his alcohol problem, uh, alcohol abuse problem, to the fact that he had like a you know he had problems in his childhood with with self image. I think he was he said he was a bullet a few times. I'm sure all of this is actually is contributing, but the main problem is that the overexertion in competitive athletes leads to dramatic suppression of the thyroid gland and consequently of of basically overactivation of adrenal function, and it has been shown that. Whenever you have a thyroid problem, it leads to to basically decline in carbon dioxide production. Carbon dioxide production uh, is crucial for bone health and especially dental health. They are still bones, right? Um, and in addition, competitive athletes almost across the board have problem with gut permeability because of their constant exertion. Usually, you know, that's why the athletes it involves some kind of a physical, intense physical movement. You may be a swimmer, you may be a boxer, you may be a, a gymnast, whatever it is. But you, you're you're pushing your body to the limits on a regular basis, and that's one of the most certain ways to cause uh, a dramatic increase in gut permeability, dramatic increase in endotoxin absorption into the blood, and subsequently translocation of the endotoxin and even some of the bacteria that was in your gut into different tissues. I've already po- you may see the studies I posted on the forum about many cancers, when they actually operate and take them out, they find that they're, they're in the cancer there's endotoxin and bacteria which can, could have only come from the gut because it matches perfectly the composition of the microbiome. And conversely, when they administer antibiotics to animal models, in many cases, the cancers disappear. So they're driven the cancer is driven by this this gut dysbiosis, the endotoxemia and the bacterial translocation into distant places. What does that have to do with teeth? Periodontal disease is known to be caused by localized inflammation, activation of the endotoxin receptor, TLR4, and the heavy presence of bacteria there. And the dentists have been mystified for decades as to what's causing this. What is endotoxin doing in your teeth? How is this possible? There shouldn't be endotoxin here. Guess what? It comes from the gut. You don't need to, like, you don't have to eat endotoxin. But the very fact that the, the TLR4, which is the endotoxin receptor, is known to be very highly expressed in inflamed gum tissue, and the more severe the periodontal disease, the higher the expression of the of that receptor, speaks heavily of the uh, of basically of, of an endotoxin angle uh, in regards to dental health. And also... They, you know, even dentists know that, you know, the gum tissue of these people with periodontal disease contains a lot of bacteria. So, conversely, back in the days, in the before the 1950s, there was no periodontal special. There were no periodontal specialists. There weren't that many endodontists. There weren't that many dental surgeons. There wasn't. I don't think there was any dental cleaning, which is what mm-hmm. we do right now, right? You go to a dentist to they they apply anesthesia because they go under your gums to get the bacteria and the plaque out of there. They were treating people with periodontal disease by administering either laxatives or antibiotics, which demonstrates directly the connection between gut health and dental health. 
and also there, 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 there's multiple studies which that demonstrate that if you elevate the levels of carbon dioxide in the blood, dental health dramatically improves. So it's just like your bones. Basically, thyroid, low thyroid function combined with endotoxemia is the direct cause of poor dental health and especially periodontal. So the protocol would be, you know, don't do anything that compromises your gut. And there's tons of things that compromise your gut. One of those big ones, though, is, you know, over-exercise. And- over-exercise. Uh, stretching to the point where you're twisting the intestines so that it starts to release serotonin. 90% of serotonin is produced in your gastrointestinal tract. Be, be kind to it. Be nice to it, right? To the to the intestine, not to the serotonin. Because if you treat it well, it will not produce as much serotonin. Any mechanical trauma, any overstretching or any kind of a position, even yoga, that, that pushes you into an, a, a, an unnatural posture for, for an extended amount of time, and I don't know the exact numbers, but you most people probably feel it. If you feel this is a chore, if you feel this is a torture, it is probably not good for you, right? So mechanically affecting the intestine, eating poorly digestible foods, right? Things that don't digest well, they go there, they, they go to, the, to your colon, they feed the bacteria, you get more endotoxin because that's how the toxin is produced. All of these things are things that need to be avoided in order to keep intestinal health up. Gotcha. Um, antibiotics are an option. Charcoal is a great option, right? Let's face it, not, not everybody has the time or, or energy really to be paying so much attention to what they eat and, you know, and, and avoiding all of these stressful things. Sometimes you can't avoid, right? Sometimes you kind of have to participate in things that stress you out or, or, or you're overexerting yourself. You may maybe like something involved with a family. Maybe you have to run around all day and do all these errands, carry heavy things, right? So sometimes it's, it's not very avoidable, but to mitigate it, you can do things that keep the bacterial count low or at least as low as possible or keep the endotoxin level low, which for which eating insoluble fiber, and I my personal favorite is actually charcoal, because it's much more effective and you can carry it as pills or powder, mm-hmm. right? Just taking a few charcoal capsules every other day or even twice a week would be enough, goes a long way towards ensuring that the endotoxin levels will be low, or at least acceptable, and then very little would translocate from the gut into your bloodstream and reach your gums to cause damage there. Now, you can do local things too. So ideally, and what dentists have been trying to accomplish for the last 30 years, is to find a way to administer antibiotics into your gums um, in a convenient way. Clearly, injections is one option, but let's face it, it's not convenient, it's not pleasant. Nobody wants to get injected into your gums, into their gums like, you know, on a regular basis. There's the risk, of course, of infection. Dentists are trying to balance that against you know the benefits of the antibiotic there's the option there's the uh, issue of antibiotic resistance of the bacteria etc so what can you do to keep the bacteria in your mouth or at least in your gums down to an acceptable level well um listerine which is being sold for, as a as a mouth disinfectant is actually the only dental remedy commercially available that has shown some evidence of a protective effect on cavities and periodontal disease it's not brushing it's not, it's not flushing. It's not doing, I mean, because these things help, but only peripherally because they kind of like prevent the bacteria from getting the food that it needs to produce acid, right? And produce endotoxin, which is what's ruining directly your gums and your teeth. So it's really should be striking at the bacteria. So keeping the digestion, you know, healthy and the GI tract healthy is one way to keep the bacteria low because, right, you're preventing it from translocating into the gums. But the second approach would be to kill the bacteria that's already there. Can do antibiotics injections, um, you know, um, you know, can brushing, flossing, whatever. It's not really addressing the root cause of the problem. What can you do? Listerine tends to be toxic. If you do it over time, it actually has carcinogenic effect. Is there anything else you can do? And the answer is yes. The simple compound known as methylene blue. Uh, it's used as a disinfectant in aquariums, and it's capable of killing bacteria, f- uh, fungi, and viruses. One of the few chemicals out there that can do that. And what you can do is make a solution with methylene blue, which has about um, 10 to 15 milligrams of methylene blue per liter of water, right? One liter, which is about one quart. Let's use the American measures. Uh, So 10 to 15 milligrams of methylene blue per quart of water and use that as a mouthwash. So do this just as you you would use with your normal mouthwash and then, then, you know, uh, swish with this solution. Don't swallow it. You may even gargle because some of the bacteria could be in your tonsils, right? Gargle with it and then spit it out. 
And it may stay a little bit. It's not going to stay much because the concentration is not high enough to cause severe staining. But you may turn your lips or your tongue like a very slight hint of blue. But within an hour or two, because the amount is the much, this will disappear. Methadone will get decolorized when it, get, when, when it gets reduced um, because it's in, in, in its an oxidized form, it's blue, but it, in reduced form, it's colorless. So when, you, when you're doing this mouthwash, you may get a little bit of a discoloration. Within 30 minutes to an hour, it should be gone, right? And then you can do this as often as you want because it's harmless. So you do that, and, and methylene blue penetrates very well into the gum tissue. Um, and you can in, improve that, that penetration even more by, uh, by adding a little bit of alcohol. So maybe the best thing would be take a quart of vodka and then put 50 milligrams of methylene blue in that vodka and then do a mouthwash with it. And then this will sterilize whatever bacteria because the vodka will kill whatever bacteria is you know, floating around freely in your mouth, and you also improve the absorption of the methylene blue into the gum tissue, where it should be able to kill a good part, good portion of the bacteria that is living there under your teeth and in your gums. Um, and and you know, that's that should go a long way towards keeping your mouth sterile, hygienic to the point where periodontal disease could be at very at the very least um, arrested, if not reversed. It sounds like a definitely an interesting experiment. Um... So I, I, I know we don't yeah. have a ton of time left. Uh, so speaking of experiments, I want to ask you just a couple personal uh, questions because you have so much experience in this region. So what I really want to know uh, is in the past, you've done all these different uh, experiments with you know supplements and, and hormones and stuff. Are there any experiments that you gained a lot of value from? And are there any experiments that you just were the worst that you didn't gain any value from? Um, okay, so I, I kind of experiment with pretty much everything he has advised. Um, so things that, that that worked really well for me were aspirin, hands down, probably the most systemic beneficial thing you can do together with methylene blue and niacinamide. So if I have to really create this like like a uh, list of over the counter things that really well work really well for me, aspirin, methylene blue, and the B vitamins would be would be you know at, at the top of the list. Okay. Um, with, from the from the uh, prescription chemicals, or at least the ones that are not available over the counter. Well, actually, Benadryl is. Benadryl is also uh, gave me a great experience in terms of lowering elevated blood sugar due to stress. Um, and actually, there are human studies demonstrating that effect. So that's one thing I, I tried. Uh, my father has type two diabetes, and um, so he he's not on, on any medication. He used to use metformin. He he still lives in Bulgaria. But it, he finds that it gives him lactic acid symptoms, which metformin is known for. In fact, it, there's another drug called fenformin, which is a, the more dangerous cousin of, of, of metformin. It can actually kill you through lactic acidosis. It's a really nasty condition. Very little that medicine currently can do. Not that, not because there's no science, because if they knew to how to administer thiamine, vitamin B1, methylene, etc., they wouldn't be able to save you. But as far as official remedies, lactic acidosis, if you go to a hospital, I mean, about 30% of the people with established lactic acidosis die. So anyways, so for diabetes type 2, I found out that Benadryl works really well in terms of dropping the blood sugar. So does cyproheptadine. Um, to the point where a few of the people that write to me have been able to get their, their blood sugar down to the normal levels just by using cyproheptadine which I think demonstrates immediately the role of cortisol or role of serotonin, the role of free fatty acids of prolactin and, and all of these stress factors, stress mediators, mediators of stress in, in one of the most prevalent, actually the most prevalent chronic condition. 30% of Americans are pre-diabetic, 40% are obese. Um, and I think basically they're saying that if the current trends continue, 40% will be diabetic in about 10 years. Um, so if there's a remedy out there that, that seems to work so so simply uh, and without without much side effects, no, I mean, Benadryl is over the counter in the United States, Cyproheptin is not. I think that's something that needs to be more widely known. Things that uh, in other things that work, the antibiotic uh, approach worked, but I noticed that um, basically the I started getting diminishing mm. effects, and I think in my in my view this is due to bacteria becoming uh, adapted. To the antibiotic, to the specific antibiotic that you're using. So, as far as keeping the gut clean, which Pete is very big on, um, yes, the antibiotics work. But if you use the same antibiotic over and over and over again, eventually you'll get 
I, at least I got, uh, diminishing results and even constipation, which is a sign of that, you know, it's really not helping. It should be the other way. Like the bowel transit should improve if the gut microbiome is is, uh, yeah. is reduced. So what worked in that aspect is is rotating antibiotics. So maybe, you know, one week, if you're having really bad digestive problems, you, you, you use the tetracycline antibiotics. And then like the second time, next time what happens, you don't use that, you use like the one of the penicillin classes, right? Like amoxicillin, um, you know, uh, penicillin. Um, there, there are quite a few of them that are out there. Um, and then the, the next time this happens, you can pr- probably use one of the macrolides. Um, so so just rotating the antibiotic in general seems to work, but they, they're not over the counter, so they're yeah. hard to find. So um, so is, is there any self-experiment you did that, you know, you went in thinking this is going to be great and it just ended up being terrible or just fell flat so i had a very poor experience with milk for ages for ages i mean this as you know milk is very big in in, in pitarianism and um you know just in general as a recommendation of uh, uh, uh as a food uh, a recommendation for a food and i i could not find a good milk until um i'm not going to mention the brand because i don't want to i don't want it to sound like an endorsement but recently there was there was a type of milk uh, released and i buy it uh, from whole foods because i don't live near a farm so I kind of, I mean, I'm relying, uh, relying on commercial food. So all of the milks that I tried, even the organic ones, turn out to have either gum, some kind of a gum in them, acacia gum, caro bean gum, locust bean gum. They're all used as emulsifiers, even in organic products, inorganic products, um, and, and or even car- carrageena. That's also approved for for usage in organic yeah, products. Kind of nuts. And sometimes they don't even list it on the label because if it's below a certain amount per gram, they FDA regulations say you 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 can skip it. You don't have to list it on the label. But I, I have a lab which I use to test a number to test different chemicals that we get from our bulk vendors, right? When we produce supplements, I want to be sure that what I'm putting out there is actually what it's supposed to be, right? So we have a lab that does tests, and I've sent to them milk samples from. Pretty much every vendor, large commercial vendor that sells in Whole Foods, and every single one of them turned out to have either silica or one of the gums or carrageenan, and none of these things were listed on the label. So I had poor experience with milk for four, up to maybe four years until last year I stumbled upon a milk that la- the label basically said it's just milk and vitamin A and D. And then uh, that milk seems to have been sitting well with me. And for the first time, I experienced the benefits of, of drinking more milk because, you know, the if, you, if your metabolism improves, your temperature should rise, your pulse should rise, your mood should improve. You know, many things should improve. You should, you should feel healthy, right? And and every time I tried a different milk brand or, or, or even cheeses, I had this poor experience. My digestion will slow down to a crawl. Um, I'll get, like, irritable. I'll get uh, depressed. I'll get annoyed, or easily annoyed. Um, and these are all signs of, of intestinal irritation, intestinal inflammation. So milk for a very long time did not work for me at all. Uh, and I've, I I think I've been pretty vocal about this on the forum as well. Uh, dairy uh, worked a little bit, but not nearly as well as I thought it should. And again, I, I found that most cheeses through lab testing contain things that you would never think should be, you know, you'll find in a cheese. Some of them c- contain sand. <laughs> some of them, which is, uh, yeah. I guess, that's where they extract the silica from, right? Some of them, some of them contain actually have a abnormally high level of endotoxin in the actual cheese. That's what the lab found, actually higher than what FDA allows. Some of them contain fecal matter. Some of them contain silica, you know, which is pretty common. It's an anti-caking agent. Um, some of them contain very high levels of the endocrine disruptors, such as BPA or BPS, which is a it's more recent replacement. So, unfortunately, the food that's out there is 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 highly compromised. And uh, my the you know my poor experience, the most poor the poorest of my experience have been with finding and experimenting with a number of different foods that that uh, metabolic theory or pitarianism say should work, but they didn't. Not only they didn't, but I felt like they were making me worse. Um, and probably the crown jewel is I do not respond consistently well to thyroid. I think that's and that seems to be uh, the experience of many other people as well. Um, and I found out that if I take thyroid, but my digestion is suffering, in other words, if the gut is irritated for whatever reason, it actually can make me feel worse. So in my case, it is better to take something like, let's say, like I'm already in a situation where gut is being irritated. 
uh, you know, bowel tragedy is slow, uh, slowing down. So for me, it's better to actually try some cyproheptine or Benadryl, which blocks serotonin and toxin, and then a few hours later, try thyroid. Because if I don't, if I take the thyroid while I'm in this state of agitation and nervousness and irritability, thyroid actually makes it much mm. worse. So lastly, the uh, the other thing I like to ask people who I interview, uh, in a few sentences, what do you find out there is the worst mainstream advice that people hear for their health? Um, I think eat too little. And, and what is it? The, the, the motto is uh, eat less and move yeah, more. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I think that just in general, considering the food that we have, which is already compromised, eating less of it can sometimes be beneficial, but they're not really advising you to eat less of any specific foods, which is what the advice should be. They're saying just eat less calories calories in general. Well, nothing, very, I'm sure I say nothing, very few things are worse for your metabolism than not eating enough calories, right? Ultimately, um, you know, it, uh, not many people know, but uh, people who are overweight, even obese in general, on average have higher metabolism than skinny people. Now, the metabolism is mostly determined, endogenous resting metabolism, RMR, resting metabolic rate, is determined mostly of the ratio of lean mass to uh, to total mm. body mass, right? And believe it or not, skinny people have a lower ratio than obese people because they carry, yes, they carry less fat, but also carry a lot less muscle as well. So it's if you have to choose between the two evils, being obese or at least overweight may be preferable, which has recently been confirmed in a number of studies, and now they call it the obesity paradox. I yep, don't know yep, if you've I've seen heard the of it. Post that I've had before, right? Yeah. So these people, the apparently obese and, and 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 overweight people, tend to fare dramatically better in in critical health conditions. So if you are in the hospital, you have a several fold higher chance of dying, regardless of the reason you went into the hospital unplanned. Right? We're not talking about scheduled surgeries. Like let's say you have to go to the ER. Your chance of dying in the ER is two to three fold higher if your BMI is below 25. Yeah. Right. Now, of course, below 25 could mean you're malnourished, right? But I'm, you know, between 23 and 25, which most doctors will say it's that's where you should be, they actually did just as bad as the really skinny people as well, and combined much worse than the obese people. And the people who did the best were people who are pre-obesity. In other words, BMI 32 to 34. Um, so eat less and move more. It's a recipe for disaster. And it's the way it currently stands because they're saying, you know, don't eat animal products. Don't eat animal fats, eat mostly plants. What was that famous guru dietary who said, eat real food, not too much, mostly yeah. plants. Wasn't there like uh, a, was that David yeah. or uh, the, the avocado guy? I don't know. It may be the avocado guy, but he's a famous nutritional guru published a few books. Most doctors are currently more or less basing their, their dietary advice to his yeah. on, on his work, and I think that specific advice uh, eat okay re- eat real food is good, right? But what does that mean? It it does involve animal food. It involves seafood. It involves you know it involves uh, beef. It involves uh, things yeah. like lamb. Um, so so eat real food is a good advice, but yes, to the context matters, right? If that in, and he he kind of establishes context with his second advice, mostly plants. Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, depending on the plant. Most plants, just like us, they don't like to be eaten. <laughs> um, in fact, they've developed they've developed a number of different defense mechanisms against being eaten. And there's only certain portions of plants that are really meant to be eaten. And if it's a plant, it's a vegetable, actually. Most of them have developed defense mechanisms everywhere um, that prevent herbivorous animals from eating them. But the herbivorous animals have developed counter defenses, which is this extensive stomach that contains three or more chambers right the ruminant animals so they sit there and they can digest and digest and digest they spend 12 hours digesting a single meal of grass because they have to break down all of these uh, in order to break down the plant they, they have to put in all of these digestive enzymes and 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 spend a lot of time grinding it right we our stomachs are not that way and plants we're not meant to eat the most of the plants that grow above earth um we some of the root plants are, are beneficial for us kind of because they contain uh in many cases the the let's say like take the potato well the potato the fruit of the potato is actually in the root right so that potato the plant like uh is it, kind of like evolved to be to be eaten not digest not cut up but they're hoping that it will be carried away further away from the plant so that the plant can reproduce um some of the other roots like like turnip like carrots 
Um, uh, so these things are, are probably also not. I mean, uh, I think ginger also grows underground, or not, um, or at least, or at least curry. So these things are, are are less bad because they were kind of meant to be consumed by other organisms and carried away. They also because they they try to prevent themselves from being eaten by bacteria. They all, they contain many of the many of the roots contain strong antibacterial and antifungal chemicals, which are also beneficial because we have fungi and we have bacteria in our intestine, and they're they're almost universally pathological. They're not good to be. They shouldn't be there, at least in large numbers. So roots of the plants are usually okay. Most of the of the plant that grows above earth is not okay in its in its raw form. So all of these vegan movements and things like sweet green and and chopped and, and I don't know what other big salad chains are out there. That's actually one of the worst foods you can eat. Like you, you're not a horse, <laughs> you're not a sheep, and, and you're not meant to be. Uh, I know some politicians probably come close to that definition, but uh, you're not meant to be eating these things raw. So cooked, I think uh, if you're cooked, then the green leafy parts are probably beneficial because they contain a lot of keto acids and they contain calcium, they contain magnesium because of the chlorophyll, um, which is kind of like our hemoglobin, but instead of iron, it contains magnesium. But in order for these things to be to be uh, digestible and utilizable by an organism, they need to be cooked because it's the heat processing that really breaks down uh, many of these enzymes that are they were developed by the plant to prevent digestion. So cooking is the equivalent of the three-chamber stomach of the ruminant animals. So if you're going to be eating mostly plants, then make sure that you're eating well-cooked food. And certain plants are really, uh, are, are like, a, are, in my experience, are a no-no. Most of the legumes are highly estrogenic. Um, and they're animals that refuse to eat them. For example, horses and most of the, like the horse, donkey, um, like a um, hini or whatever other, uh, combinations of these hoof, large hoof animals will refuse to eat legumes, whether the grain or the leaves. Uh, and in fact, you can cause very reliably. They, they in some countries they use an extract like a like a tincture from uh, from from the bean plant, any bean plant really, um, or even a soy plant uh, to cause abortion in in domestic animals. Um, so they're highly estrogenic. They contain phytoestrogens that are more potent than our hormone known as estradiol, which is the most potent endogenous estrogen. Um, so if you're going to be eating plants, make sure it's mostly the green leafy parts or the roots, right? And then fruits. Uh, ripe fruit is good. It was meant to be eaten. It has a, you know, the, the pit inside was meant to be digested. Another is, was meant to be eaten. It will pass through undigested. And then that's how a new plant starts. So those are the parts of the the plant world, world that I think are beneficial. But everything else, in terms of doctors avoiding to avoid saturated fat, avoid animal products, right? You eat as little as possible. You're eating too much. We're moving too little. None of this is supported by evidence. Um, I'll send you an article to uh, send to the people who try to try to uh, challenge this. Recent studies have shown that it's not just humans that are getting uh, obese. Wild animals are also getting obese. And there's little, very little argument can be made that wild animals suddenly picked up the habit of watching TV and eating chips. They're still moving as much as they used to um, in their natural habitat, but they're also getting fat, right? They're not eating more and they're not moving less, but they're getting as fat as we are. So something else is going on. And even though like the maybe no single cause, it's very obvious that it's has, has something to do with decline in the quality of the environment probably mostly related to endocrine disruptors um, and other stresses such as increasing carcinogenic chemicals, electromagnetic field exposure, um, and just just stress in general. Even wild animals were, recent studies demonstrated that uh, levels of cortisol in fish have, have risen dramatically over the last 10 years, and nobody knows why. At the same time, the levels of thiamine, vitamin B1, in fish has also dropped, and and it's it's acknowledged universally that these, these, both of these are bad signs, but but there's no explanation for them currently. Um, so if so, it's not that we are eating too much and we're moving too little. Um, some people maybe, but that's not what's really killing you. What's killing you is the decline of metabolism as a result of potentially eating, uh, you know, eating too little and moving too much, and also a number of different factors more or less invisible that are in the environment, such as you know. Um, you know, keeping your cell phone glued to your head, whether directly or through one of these Bluetooth earpieces. At this point, even NIH published a study saying 
uh, EMF is directly carcinogenic. There's very little doubt about it. No matter how much the 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 phone industry is trying to spin to spin it and present it, it's like still still controversial. Mm-hmm. Controversial is a euphemism for it's true, but it hurts sales. So shut <laughs> shut up. So that's 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 really what what they mean wow. by that, or at least delay the publication until we can sell some more. Yeah. Um, but if if it's any if it's any indication when the government, which is heavily controlled, the agents are at this point captured by the by the private industries in many cases. If National Institute National Institute of Standard and Technology NIST, which is located about three miles from where I live. Um, and then National Institute of Health, also about you know a few miles from where I live. If both of them are coming out with extensive studies saying uh, cell phone radiation is a known human, not probable, known human carcinogen, then then I think it's already established. In other words, there, even if these conservative agencies that are serving businesses are already saying that, that means the reality is probably much much worse, you know, much scarier. Yeah. Than that. Yeah, well, this exactly. has been just like such a treasure trove of information on your health and stuff. So I think we should probably wrap it up here. But what's what's next for you? Do you have plans for a new supplement, a book, new studies? Uh, yeah, I mean, I will continue with the studies um, and and products as well. Um, our up one of our upcoming product that will hopefully will release in the next month or so will be a, a very potent fatty acid oxidation inhibitor, um, similar to the drug meldonium, also known as mildronate. Um, and that, that is a drug that was originally developed to treat angina or chest pain in people and heart disease. Uh, it was developed in the Soviet Union, and subsequently, it was never approved for, for, for any such indication in the Western countries, uh, but it was it found use as a doping agent for athletes. In other words, it improves the performance of the individual because it improves the performance of the heart by shifting your metabolism towards oxidation of glucose and blocking the oxidation of fat. But it recently got banned. Uh, So now it's basically, if if you're caught possessing it, uh, there could be penalties for that. Um, And it's very hard to obtain, right? So it also requires pretty high doses in order to be effective. So there is a molecule out there that works very similarly. It's little known because it's just an obscure group in Europe that published on it. So we, we, we have a lab now that we work with very closely, and we managed to synthesize it. So we will be releasing that as a product, and it's about 15 times more potent than wow. mildronate in inhibiting the oxidation of fat. So the daily dosage equivalent for humans is just 100 milligrams, while for mildronate is about 1,500, so about 15 times stronger. And we're going to do a few studies with it for cancer. So I'm not trying to give athletes the means to dope and to <laughs> and, and to win medals <laughs> illegitimately, right? I'm sure that will be one outcome potentially. Not sure, but potentially. What I'm trying to do is that if the metabolic theory is correct, and in, even if Pete is right only on that, back to your earlier question, it doesn't really matter what else he gets wrong. If we manage to show that this thing treats, potentially cures cancer, then they, you know another huge branch of medicine will more or less collapse because right now the approach is let's kill the evil cancer cell because otherwise it will kill you. And the metabolic approach is no, don't kill the cancer cell. Cancer cell is just a normal cell that has been stressed and abused to the point of deciding that you're no longer a suitable host so it will kill you. <laughs> so, so this drug works towards calming down that cell by stop overloading with fatty acids and restoring normal glucose metabolism. So that's one upcoming product. Uh, we have a few more. Uh, based One of them is based on uh, the plant tribulus terrestris. It's basically, it was known as like the herbal aphrodisiac. That's herbal big in Viagra. Bulgaria, right? Huge in Bulgaria, yes. But it's, it's huge all over the world at this point. Um, and some studies came out that have kind of bashed it. They said, no, we didn't really see much of an effect on humans. But those studies turn out to be sponsored. Back to our, to our earlier discussion, whether something is yeah. viable or not. Those studies turn out to be sponsored indirectly by groups profiting from the sales of Viagra. Oh. Um, and studies have continued to come out with tribulus from, in many countries, except in countries where Viagra is very strong in terms of sales demonstrating consistently beneficial effect of tribulus terrestris or from the very, the very from a component inside of it called protodiocin. And it's very similar structurally to pregnenolone and or DHEA. So we're trying to isolate that as a pure molecule and potentially release that as a, as a supplement because it should work almost, almost the same as testosterone 
but without many of the side effects because unlike testosterone, this thing cannot convert into wow. estrogen. So we're hoping to come up with a herbal version of testosterone and you know and release that as a product. Wow. And then in terms of studies, uh, that the, you know that group in Bulgaria and the group in China, I'll continue to employ them, you know, God willing, um, if, and if there's funds available. And then we're currently planning two studies with our product Oxidal, which contains methylene blue. One of them will be uh, for reversing aging in in live organisms. Now there were there, there were two studies published back in 2017 showing that methylene blue fully reverses the aging in vitro um, of cells that were basically had had the features of progeria. And progeria is a, a disease of accelerated aging where you look at people that are that are basically you know eight years old and they look like yeah. they're 80. Just if you Google progeria, you'll get this. So it was shown that methylene blue reverses that in a pet in a pet, in a petri dish. So we're trying. We're actually currently embarking on a study that will try to do the same thing in a living organism. Uh, I think the first study will be with yeast, just to confirm whether I mean, just to see if 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 if, if the results are promising, and then if that works, then we'll move to another organism, uh, which will be either a, a, rat, a rat or 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 a mouse. And the reason we don't directly jump to the uh, mice and rats is that they live for several years, right? It will be a long time of administration of this thing, just to see if it has any effects. So, understandably, not many people want to embark on this study, um, even though I am, unless they have an indication from a simpler model, which is like a drosophila fly or a, or a yeast that shows, that demonstrates an effect. So, we're going to try to do that. If the anti-aging is confirmed in yeast, we're moving on to mammals. Right. And then, and basically, we're going to test the, the this mildronate equivalent on a number of different lethal cancers. Um, I will try melanoma, pancreatic cancer, and neuroglioblastoma because those cancers, recent studies came out and said uh, the evidence is clear. Can, this, specifically, these cancers, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's all of them, but specifically for these cancers, there's evidence that they, they prefer fat as fuel and not glucose. And if you inhibit their either their supply of fat or you inhibit their, their ability to metabolize fat or whatnot, these tumors m- disappear almost magically over the course of two, three days. So we're going to test uh, this new fatty acid oxidation inhibitor uh, for a number of these cancers um, using either mice or rats or hamsters or whatever is available. So it should be it should be pretty exciting. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Well, thanks again so much for being on, man. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, there'll be a bunch of stuff in the show notes, a lot of the links Georgie mentioned here, and uh, yeah, thanks again, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, thanks for inviting me, and I'll send you uh, you know the links that I remember we discussed. Uh, I think the UNID studies will be very important because many people don't even know about uh, this guy and his work. Um, you know, the, uh, the the studies on dental health, the correlation between athleticism and poor dental health, I think that that will come as a shock to many people saying like, how come these people are should be the spinning image of health? And apparently yeah. they're not. All right. Great to talk to you, Georgie. Great to talk to you, man. Thank you. You know, Georgie has such a flow. You know, I really enjoyed how he can go from topic to topic almost seamlessly and really connect them in a way that makes sense. <laughs> you know, when I asked him about the the whole dental health thing, I was a little curious and skeptical when he started talking about Michael Phelps, but he, you know, he brought it around and it, it made sense. So anyway, lots of links in the show notes. There's a bunch of studies on DHT, prostate cancer, uh, cortinon, the falling credibility of science. Uh, you can also find Georgie's store online, uh, and you can find the link to that store in the show notes. You can also look at Methylene Blue Info if you're so interested. Now, if you got value from this podcast, we need your help. Please share it to get the word out about quacks. You see, guys, my goal is to cure chronic disease and type 1 diabetes and these conditions that have um, cropped up with our modern lifestyle. And so if you want to support me and Brian as we do that, um, you know, sharing is really great. Like I said, also, you could go to our uh, our homepage and click on the Amazon banner and shop through our portal. That will give us some pennies and dimes here and there to kind of help help with hosting and all that stuff. So uh, you can find us at quackspodcast.com or follow us on Twitter at quackspod. I hope you enjoyed our 50th episode and I will see you next week.